I've been fishing in Alaska for the last six summers with my dad. Never seen anything unexplainable, but have been creeped out a few times. A lot of it comes from lack of sleep since we are out there for up to 60 hours at a time with no more than four hours between every time we put the net out. Anyway, here's a few things. I was on deck by myself late at night and a tree wrapped in ball kelp got pulled on. Looked like some kind of giant squid. We've had a 600 pound shark caught in our net. That was scary. Caught two porpoises at once. They had already drowned when we got to them. Not so much creepy as it was startling, then it was just sad. Found two oil drum-sized pieces of styrofoam about 300 yards away from each other. We figure they were tsunami debris from the one that hit Japan in 2011. Interesting that they would stay so close together for so far. Found an acoustic guitar in its case floating near a beach. The strings had rusted away, but the body was in good shape. Really, the weirdest things are in my own head. I'll have waking dreams where I can't move or something very dangerous is happening. I sometimes wake up completely disoriented and nervous, which makes working hard. I should probably stop fishing. Three months ago, my wife and I decided to take a drive up Mary's Peak Road in Oregon. We were excited to explore the highest mountain in the state's coast range, towering at 497 feet. The weather was crisp and cool, with plenty of snow still covering the peak in mid-April. As we were coming down the mountain around 4.30 p.m., we spotted a beautiful waterfall surrounded by wildflowers. The sight was too enchanting to pass up, so we decided to stop and take in the view. I remember stepping out of the car, the chilly air nipping at my exposed skin, and feeling a sudden, inexplicable sensation. It was as if the hair on my neck stood on end, and for a moment, time itself seemed to freeze. Just then, I heard a faint tink-tink on the ground, followed by a flash past the car window. Startled, I looked down and saw an old, rusty, dented, blue two-pound coffee can lying near us. It looked like it was from a brand I recognized, maybe Maxwell. If I had been standing outside at that moment, it would have hit me. The sudden impact and the strangeness of the object made my heart race with fear. Panicked, my wife and I immediately got back in the car and prepared to leave. As I glanced back towards the road, I caught a glimpse of a tall, blurry, reddish-brown figure standing about 200 feet away, just beyond the guardrail. My mind raced, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. Was it just a tree, or could it have been something more? I've always been fascinated by the stories of Bigfoot, and have read extensively about the elusive creature. Although I couldn't be sure, the figure I saw that day bore a striking resemblance to the descriptions I've come across in my research. I've heard accounts of Bigfoot throwing objects to scare away intruders, and the coffee can seem to fit the bill. I couldn't help but wonder if we had unintentionally stumbled upon its territory. We didn't stick around long enough to find out. The fear and uncertainty that gripped us in that moment were enough to send us on our way leaving the mysterious figure and the unexplained coffee can behind. To this day, I can't say for certain what we encountered on Mary's Peak Road, but a part of me hopes that it was indeed a Bigfoot, reminding us that some things in this world are still left to be discovered. This is a nest sighting, not an actual creature sighting. I was a member of an archaeology survey crew, and we had hiked in along an old, overgrown logging RR grade on the side of Pelican Butt. This grade took off from an old, closed logging road. We were approximately one mile from the end of the closed road, when we found a very large nest on the ground, which measured about seven feet in diameter. It was constructed of pine needles and small twigs. The nest material was about 8-12 feet in height. It was about 150 meters yards uphill from the old grade that we were following. The only reason we found it at all was because a crew member saw a spotted owl in a tree up the hill, and we went up to get a closer look. The owl flew up the hill a bit farther, 
and we followed, trying to catch a good glimpse of the owl as most of us had never seen one in the wild. That's when we noticed the huge nest on the ground. Was the owl leading us there? All six crew members felt it was a Bigfoot nest. We reported it to the wildlife biologist back at the office, and he said there are some large birds that make nests on the ground, which can be up to three feet in diameter, such as cranes, but he's never heard of one that large. Also, cranes nest in meadows near water, not on the side of a mountain several miles from water. When we suggested a Bigfoot nest, he just shrugged and said, maybe? This was a very remote location and hadn't been logged in years, probably since the 1950s. We also discovered a very old logging camp archaeology site dating from the Ely 19s which had old glass bottles still intact, which was evidence that no one had been there in a very long time, as most other old sites which were in more accessible places had been looted for the glass bottles. Point being, this was an area where no one goes, so if this were a hoax, it's a terrible place to do it, as chances are, no one is going to see it. Unfortunately, no one took a photo. While I was stationed in Cherry Point, I had the duty of inspecting the Marines' barracks on Thursday morning after field day. Most rooms were normal. Dust bunnies here, scum stain there, but one day I stumbled a crow as something disturbing. I went through one Marine's room, he was an avi cat, and I noticed his wall locker was unlocked. Whenever I see unlocked wall lockers, I would go through them just for kicks. Well, this devil had somehow accumulated about 20 pairs of women's underwear. Some were even marked. When confronted, SNM stated, it's not a crime to have women's thongs. Turns out, it is when you steal it from the laundry room. This story is my husband's and occurred in the 1970s. He was erecting fences with a mate in rural Springbrook, which is in the Gold Coast hinterland about 70 kilometers south of Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. There's a very hilly region with dense rainforest. They were cutting a fence line when they smelled a horrible stench and heard a noise that sounded like a combination of a pig grunting and a dog growling about 20 meters away. They couldn't see anything due to the dense bush. My husband turned to his mate, who was a big man, to find him already running full speed in the opposite direction. He then took off after him. They returned to the job two days later after stopping at the forest ranger station on the way to ask him if there had been any reports of wild boars in the area. The ranger laughed and said it was possible and then told them that part of his job was to keep the walking and hiking trails clear of weeds and brush. He'd walk the trails with a machete looking just ahead of him at his feet and clearing any unwanted vegetation when he smelled a stench and the hairs on the back of his neck stood up. Looking up, he saw a bipedal brown hairy creature staring at him about 13 meters ahead. He froze and stared at it until it turned and disappeared into the thick scrub. My husband and his mate continued on to the fence job, but did not hear, smell, or see anything again. A few years later, they were working in a similar landscape, near the location of the previous encounter. They had heard from several local farmers who had heard similar noises to what they had heard previously, and who had seen a hairy bipedal creature run into their paddocks, grab a sheep or a calf, and then run back into the dense forest. There are Yowie researchers who have had similar encounters and have taken thermal images of a large bipedal creature. We know they exist. When we get the chance, my father and a few of his friends go camping up in Baxter State Park in Maine. For anyone who doesn't know, it's a pretty secluded section of the state and pretty much everything surrounding the park grounds is also wilderness. While up there, we took a hike to some fishing ponds buried deep in the woods. The trails were mostly overgrown, and the destination was a place that you really had to be in the know to find it. My dad's friend who was accompanying is a native Mainer and knows lots of secret fishing spots like that. 
Needless to say, not too many people walk those trails, and the closest town is hours and hours away. Well, anyways, my dad's friend starts talking about this old store in the woods he remembered from his childhood. He said fishermen in the area knew about it, and you could get bait and ice and few other minor conveniences. He said he hadn't been there since childhood, but faintly remembered it being somewhere near where we were. I remember thinking it was bullshit, just a made-up story. My dad's friend is a charming guy, but he's known to tell some tall tales. Considering how far out in the wilderness we were, I thought it was absolutely ludicrous for any store or any other human for that matter to be nearby. I mean, the closest road you could take a car on was about two hours from where we were on the trail. But sure enough, about 45 minutes later, we come to this pond and the trail forks. My dad's friend just says, this is it. This is the path to the store. I remember it. So he starts walking down one of the paths, which extended a good ways about half a mile around the perimeter of the pond. We get to a clearing in the woods and it just opens up into this huge field with about 10 of what appeared to be houses or living compounds. It slightly reminded me of that town specter from Big Fish. I was absolutely shocked to see any trace of humanity. If you know the area of Maine I'm talking about, you would be too. The place was completely empty, but none of the buildings looked run down. The whole property was definitely maintained. We started to walk around, and after a couple minutes, this really old guy with a thick Maine accent came out of one of the houses, and my dad's friend went up to talk to him. Turns out the store was real, and we bought some ice and left. I half expected to hear the Twilight Zone theme when I saw this place. Not really creepy, but very mysterious. I'm still shocked that such a strange random place like this exists in the world, and I still have so many unanswered questions to this day. Why so far out in the middle of nowhere? What were all the other buildings for? Where was everyone else? How does this one guy live two hours from the closest road and survive, let alone get any business? I was 61 years old when I had the most unusual encounter of my life. I'm an unassuming man, steady and phlegmatic, with a thick brush of white hair and a craggy outdoorsman's face. I enjoy a pint and a dram, but I never indulge when I'm working. I've spent my entire adult life working as a forester in the Ditchmont Woods located in Livingston, West Lothian, Scotland. On the morning of Friday, November 9, 1979, I set off with my red setter Lara to check the woods on Ditchmont Law for stray sheep and cattle. It was a damp day, and as I parked the van and set off down the forest track, the noise of the Edinburgh-Glasgow motorway was muffled by the thick, dark fir trees. The dog ran ahead, and my trudging Wellingtons made the only sound. Then, as I turned a corner into a clearing filled with light, I saw it an unidentified flying object UFO. The object had a dark gray color, and its texture was like an emery board, with small brighter highlighted areas against a darker background. The appearance of the exterior seemed to change, as if the UFO was attempting to camouflage itself. I estimated its size to be around 18-20 feet in diameter and about 12 feet high. It looked as if it was mounted on a ring, resembling a hat with a brim. There were also protruding stems topped by propellers on the outside of the craft. Nothing on the object was moving at the time. Suddenly, two small spheres rushed at me. They were like miniature versions of the large craft, making a sound as they approached, with spikes on the outside making contact with the ground. They stopped by my side and attached themselves to my trousers, dragging me back toward the UFO. I was overwhelmed by an extremely strong smell, causing me to struggle for air, and I soon lost consciousness. When I regained consciousness, the UFO and the smaller spheres were gone, but Laura, my red setter, was still with me. She was unsettled, running around and barking madly. As I tried to call out to her, I realized I had no voice. I couldn't stand either. Eventually, I crawled back the way I'd come for about 300 feet. 
Gradually, I was able to stand up and walk back to my pickup truck. I attempted to contact the forestry headquarters using my two-way radio, but found that my voice had not yet returned. I tried to drive back home in my pickup truck, but it got stuck in the mud. So I began the long walk back to my house, which was approximately a mile away, and finally arrived at 11.15 a.m. My entire experience had lasted just over an hour. By the time I reached home, my wife was shocked to see my condition covered in mud with torn pants. I began telling her the story of what had happened. She wanted to call the police, but I was against it, considering the subject matter. However, I allowed her to call my job supervisor, Malcolm Drummond, and inform him about the incident. While she made the calls, I took a bath to clean up. Drummond, being eager to find out what had happened, called a physician and immediately drove to my house. He questioned me while I was still in the bathtub. We both agreed that there must be some kind of physical evidence left on the ground by either the craft or the small spheres, so we headed back to the area to investigate. However, Drummond couldn't find the exact location. Dr. Gordon Adams arrived and examined my condition. He found grazed areas on my left leg and under my chin, but no apparent head injuries. At that time, my body temperature, blood pressure, and other functions seemed normal. Adams called for an ambulance to take me to the hospital for a head x-ray and a counseling session. However, I decided to postpone the hospital visit as I had planned to visit relatives over the weekend and didn't want to miss the trip. Word of the encounter spread, and soon the press caught wind of it. By Sunday, the incident was known all over the United Kingdom, and within a week, it had gained worldwide attention. The story was featured in television documentaries, magazines, and books. Even the company I worked for erected a plaque at the site to commemorate the event, although it was later stolen. The local police, inexperienced in dealing with UFO cases, didn't discount my description of the incident. They took testimony from me, my wife, and Dr. Adams. Due to the assault involved, they sent my clothing from that day for forensic examination. A cursory overview revealed torn pant legs at the hip area, and traces of a powder were found. However, it turned out that the powder was just maize starch transferred from the bag used to send in the trousers. The police also investigated any flights that might have occurred that day, but found no evidence of planes, helicopters, or any other equipment in the area. The ground markings, consisting of two parallel ladder-like tracks with holes, confirmed that something had been on the spot I indicated. I was well respected by people in the area, and there was no reason to believe I would hoax such an incident. I had a history of illnesses and surgeries, but there was nothing in my medical records suggesting head injuries or psychosis. I know what I saw, I insisted. My firm belief in my story led the police to open a criminal investigation for assault, making it the only such case in Britain arising from a UFO sighting. The investigation remains open. My neighbors, however, were more skeptical, and eventually, I decided to move away to an undisclosed address. Nevertheless, I became the most famous witness to aliens in Britain. My trousers were analyzed by psychics at spiritualist meetings, and on the anniversaries of the sighting, UFO spotters would gather in the clearing, hoping for another encounter. The aliens didn't stop there. Since that November day, West Lothian skies have been filled with glimmering disks, strange lights, and bouncing fireballs. The Falkirk Triangle now records around 300 UFO sightings a year, more than any other place on Earth. The Forge Restaurant in Bonnybridge, where fireballs sail over the trees and wingless planes are seen in the fields, has become a hot spot. Some experts suggest that West Lothian may be a thin place, offering a window from Earth into another dimension. If we accept my account as true, I was abducted by something otherworldly for about 20 minutes on November 9, 1979. No evidence has emerged to disprove my story. I was respected by those who knew me, and I never sought to profit from my alleged experience.
Normally, I get off work right around 10 p.m. This was at night when I saw this. I'm also going to leave my name out of this just in case it could hurt my law enforcement credentials. I don't know what I saw, but it was some sort of canine. I was driving down an isolated road that leads to one house on the other side of the hill. I haven't seen any cars or people on this road. It's more of a way for me to get home quicker without having to go all the way around by using this nifty shortcut. But as I'm coming up the hill on my way home, something in the middle of the road catches my eye. Well, it was more so on the side of the road, trying to make its way towards the middle. Before I even had time to think about stopping or barely swerving, whatever it was was already up against my car with its front paws and claws up against the hood. This thing was huge. I slammed my gas pedal, hoping it would get out of the way, but I began hearing this little rumbling noise like this dog growling at me, so I got out of there fast. This thing went down on all fours from two, and was now running alongside my car for a little bit before dropping back down behind me, disappearing into the darkness. Everything about this thing was huge. I can't get over it. It had massive legs and were just big. The entire body was big. Its head was huge. It had a very long snout and pointed ears. It looked kind of like a wolf, but different. The largest wolf I've ever seen. And those eyes, its eyes were from a whole other world. They were bright red. Thanks for listening to my story. Feel free to share it if you'd like, as long as you keep my name out of it. A few years ago, my wife and I were living near Laneville, Texas, which is located in Rusk County on farm to Market Route 225. My wife loves gardens, and we always had a chicken pen. Our adult children enjoy the garden produce and the fresh eggs from our hens. We lived this way for many years after we moved there in 1981. We had no intention of ever going back to the big city. The incident that I'm writing about happened in 2015, and it signaled the end of our chicken business. Each morning I have to walk down to the chicken pen that was 150 feet behind our house. After I fed the chickens and checked their water, I headed back to the house to eat breakfast. I had guns, but I never carried one around our own property. At that time we had a terrier who went everywhere we did. She had never shown any inclination to be afraid of anything, but on this day I was in the middle of my chores when the terrier stopped dead still. She was fixed on something beyond the tree line behind the chicken pen, and the hair on her neck and back stood straight up. She was frozen in place and didn't move a single muscle. I shifted my gaze to the tree line, and what I saw caught my breath. I knew I was looking at something I had never seen before. This thing apparently had been walking just outside the tree line, and it stopped when we did. It seemed to be the size of a wolf. Its head was light gray, and there wasn't a single hair on its body. Its rear legs made it appear as though it could easily walk on all fours or stand upright like a man. The tail was the same length as its body, and from where I stood it looked like a dog until it turned revealing a head that looked more like a feline than a canine with similar short pointed ears. The eyes were something unworldly. They were bright blue and bored into us for about 15 seconds, showing no sign of fear. It then turned and walked to the woods and out of sight. I tried to make sense of what I had just witnessed as I hurried and tossed the chicken feed into the pen. I realized that the terrier had already hightailed it back to the house ahead of me. Over breakfast, I told my wife about the encounter, and from that day onward the terrier would not go near the chicken pen unless she was with me. Even then she stayed behind me always watching the woods. I did too. It's strange how random things can suddenly make sense once you see a connection. A few weeks later, a feral dog got into the pen and was trying to kill a chicken. I was going to gather eggs and ever since the strange encounter that day, I had begun carrying a rifle with me. I shot the dog, got a shovel, and dug a hole behind the pen. The feral dog was the size of a large collie and must have weighed 80 or so pounds. I had to drag the carcass to the hole and roll it in. 
After burying the dog and securing the pen, I went back to the house, and that was the end of it, or so we thought. Two days later, while feeding the chickens, I noticed something odd behind the pen. I walked around to take a look. What I found was a hole two feet across right where I had buried the dead dog and the carcass was gone. There were no drag marks, so whatever it was, it was big enough to pull the body up out of the dirt and carry it off without leaving a trail. I searched all over the back of our property and never found anything that would suggest some sort of scavenger was at work. My wife and I were the only ones who knew what I had buried back there. The next morning when I went to feed the chickens, it looked like a crime scene. They were all dead and their headless remains were scattered about the pen. The rooster had been tossed 20 feet from the ground into the top of a persimmon tree. Oddly enough, given the scale of the carnage, there was not a single drop of blood anywhere. The gate was latched, and there was no hole in the fence or signs of something that gained entry by digging under the fence. But the killer had left some evidence behind. There were footprints and deep gouges made by three long claws that were estimated to be two and a half inches long. I drove over to my neighbor's house and asked him to have a look at the tracks. He was a hunter who was born and raised in the area, but even he was stumped. He suggested we call a friend of his who was a constable and another longtime resident. He looked at the tracks and examined the dead chickens. After he noticed the dead rooster dangling in the tree, he warned us not to go out at night without a gun. We decided not to replace the chickens. Not long after that incident, we moved to another location. We just didn't want to cross paths with whatever was lurking around the property. I live in Michigan and regularly go out trapping or coyote hunting. One day I'm taking a long time friend hunting for the first time. He lived out of state so he wasn't familiar with the area and its types of people and habits, so to speak. Anyways, we were walking along and unfortunately the coyote spot I usually used had now been useless after so many uses of traps and shots taken. So we went a bit deeper to look for a better spot. The coyotes had a den in some lowlands and thick brush. I don't usually go out there, but I didn't want my friend's first hunt to be a boring one, so we pressed on. After a bit of walking, my friend noticed a blood trail, and I assumed another hunter hit and wounded one. I figured we would track to make sure it didn't suffer, so we followed the blood trail. The strange part was we didn't notice any tracks, and it was winter so tracks would be easy as day to spot. However, when we reached the source, we ended up finding something a lot more gruesome. We came across the dead bodies of a man and woman. The man had a crossbow bolt in his stomach and looked like he had been stabbed. The woman was stabbed much worse and looked like she had been, quote, sexually used. Needless to say, we called the police. I've never been back to those woods since, and now when I got out I wear body armor underneath my vest and always go with a partner. I'm always going to go back to the forest, and this isn't a hunting story, but here's one unknown thing that really freaked me out. I was hiking the highest peak in Utah with a small group over one fourth of July weekend, and we had to backpack in about 12 miles to where we would set up camp. One of the guys in our group owned two pack llamas and brought them along to carry some stuff. The owner said that llamas are very territorial and will make a high-pitched gobbling sound if they feel threatened. I thought that was weird and didn't really believe him. On the second night after summiting the peak, I had a crazy headache and wasn't getting any sleep in my tiny single-person tent. I had been laying there for hours after everyone else had gone to bed, and it was late into the night when I started hearing gobbling from the llamas in our camp. Sitting alone in a tent with no protection, and not knowing what is looming around my campsite did not make for a fun night, and that was the last time I slept in a tent. In the morning everyone said they were asleep and did not hear anything. In the shadowy woods there stood a remote cabin that had long been forgotten by the world. 
The cabin was nestled far from civilization, its weathered walls and creaking timbers bearing witness to the passage of time. It had seen countless hunters seeking refuge within its walls over the years, but none had ever truly understood the chilling secret that dwelled within. One crisp autumn weekend, my friends, and I decided to escape the bustle of city life and embark on a hunting trip. We were a group of seasoned hunters, drawn together by our shared love for the outdoors and the thrill of the chase. The cabin, hidden amidst the wilderness, seemed like the perfect place to call home for a few days. As we approached the cabin, the beauty of the surrounding forest took our breath away. The trees were adorned with the fiery hues of fall, and the air was filled with the crisp scent of pine. We couldn't have asked for a more picturesque setting for our hunting weekend. The cabin itself, though showing signs of wear and tear, had an undeniable charm. Its quaint appearance with a front porch and a chimney that released plumes of smoke into the brisk air was straight out of a postcard. We eagerly unpacked our gear and settled in, ready for a few days of camaraderie and adventure. The first night was filled with laughter and stories, accompanied by the comforting warmth of a crackling fire. We shared our hunting plans and strategies, all the while unaware of the dark history that clung to the cabin's walls. It wasn't until the second night that we began to feel a shift in the cabin's atmosphere. It started with subtle noises, soft footsteps echoing in the hallway, doors creaking open and closing on their own, and a persistent tapping against the window pane. We dismissed them as the quirks of an old cabin, but the unease settled in the pit of our stomachs. As the hours passed, the atmosphere grew increasingly oppressive. A cold breeze swept through the cabin, extinguishing the fire, despite the fact that all windows and doors were securely shut. The cabin seemed to come alive with eerie shadows that danced along the walls, their movements unsettlingly deliberate. A sense of dread descended upon us, and we exchanged worried glances. That's when we heard it a faint, mournful wail that seemed to emanate from the very walls themselves. The hairs on the back of our necks stood on end as the sound grew louder, echoing through the cabin with an otherworldly, anguished quality. We knew then that we were not alone. The cabin was haunted, and the restless spirit of a previous owner had been awakened by our presence. It was a truth we couldn't deny, no matter how much we wanted to rationalize the inexplicable. The spirit, it seemed, was trying to communicate with us. We could feel its presence, a malevolent force that bore the weight of unresolved pain and anger. It yearned for something, something that had been denied to it in life, and it was determined to make us understand. We tried to leave to escape the cabin's oppressive grasp, but each attempt was thwarted by an invisible force that seemed determined to keep us trapped. Panic and fear took hold as we realized the truth our hunting weekend had become a nightmarish ordeal. As the night wore on, we huddled together, desperate for answers. We began to piece together the story of the cabin's previous owner, a man who had met a grisly end within these very walls. His restless spirit sought retribution, and it seemed that we were the unwitting targets of his torment. We spent the night in terror, our sleepless hours filled with chilling encounters and ghostly apparitions. The cabin had become a prison, its walls closing in around us as the vengeful spirit grew more insistent in its demands. By the time the first rays of dawn broke through the trees, we were physically and emotionally drained. The spirit's presence had left an indelible mark on us, and we knew that we could no longer stay in the cabin. With trembling hands, we gathered our belongings and made a final attempt to leave. As we crossed the threshold, a bone-chilling scream pierced the air, echoing through the forest. It was a sound that would haunt our nightmares for years to come. We fled the cursed cabin, never looking back, and made our way back to the safety of civilization. The hunting weekend we had so eagerly anticipated had become a harrowing ordeal, a brush with the supernatural that left us forever changed. We learned a powerful lesson that weekend, one that transcended our love for the hunt and the allure of the wilderness. Some secrets are best left undisturbed, 
and some cabins, no matter how picturesque, are forever haunted by the restless spirits of their past. This is my story with the Mothman of Chicago. I genuinely believe this one in particular roosts in bus woods in the western suburbs Rolling Meadows area. I am in a suburb next door. This occurred right at the start of the pandemic in early 2020. Many things were shut and this moonless night was easily the darkest I'd ever experienced in the suburbs. Usually light pollution means you can see 24-7 but this night was particularly dark and quiet. It was like 2 a.m., and I'm in the garage tinkering on one of the bikes listening to some music, not super loud when there was a crash on the roof of my garage. I've had raccoons jump off the tree onto it before, but this sounded like a person my size just jumped onto it. The whole building shook my garage as an old horse barn, relatively small for a barn, but big for a garage and detached and across the driveway. Well, I heard this and I knew it couldn't be a raccoon, but that's what my mind went to. So I grab a shovel and step outside trying to look up, but it's so dark I can't see a darn thing. As I round the corner of the garage into the front part of my yard, which was so dark I couldn't see my neighbor's house, I swear on my life I hear something jump down and land maybe 15 yards in front of me. I can't see anything. I don't remember hearing anything breathe, snarl, growl, or anything like that which you would if you were face to face with a raccoon. They're noisy. So I'm standing there, dead stopped holding the shovel like a walking stick unsure of what to do or even what's happening. I had a very visceral feeling that I was squaring down with something my size though I felt it. I knew I couldn't just stand there and wait to become a victim. I have a mentality that I never will be one. I'll throw the first stone every time. I raise the shovel to my other hand, taking a defensive grip and step forward, only taking one or two steps before I hear three heavy footfalls. Then I hear the fence behind my garage rattle, and then I hear a whooshing sound like a great pair of beating wings. I genuinely believe when I stepped forward whatever was there turned, jumped on the fence and took off flying. I never even caught a glimpse. I was 100% sober, no drinking, and I don't do drugs. I was not sleep deprived, I only got off work an hour and a half prior. I think my garage was the only light for miles and my music drew it in. No one, and I mean no one else, was for a mile in any direction as far as I could tell. As soon as that thing left I shut down the garage and went inside somewhat shaken thinking, holy crap. I damn near got into a fight with something, and I don't even know what it was. The reason I think that it was the Mothman and why I think it roosts in bus woods is another story entirely. This is not an embellishment. This is a real event that happened to me, albeit only one time ever. The creepiest dive of my life. Two buddies of mine and I were on a night dive in the Puget Sound hunting prawns. It was about 1 a.m. and we're a good 100 feet deep, the pitchest black you could imagine. We used to do this thing on night dives where we'd get in a circle, turn off our lights, then stir up the water and watch the bioluminescence float around us like floating stars in a black watery space. Beautiful. Only this one time we turn off our lights, stir up the water, and the water glows just enough to reveal a fourth person sitting in our circle. We were at a dive resort, so it wasn't so odd to see another diver. Only it was 1 a.m. we'd seen no one else prepping a dive at the dock. He was also alone, which was odd considering the dangerous conditions of a night dive in those waters, and he had no fins or gloves. I don't know how he swam so well without fins or didn't get hypothermia without boots or gloves. We wore dry suits because it was so cold, but this dude was in a wet suit with exposed skin, and we thought we saw a giant gash in one of the legs. So the three of us all notice him, and we're too scared to move. I can hear my buddies panting in their regs, and the guy just smiles and waves, then swims away. Whenever you think you're alone and someone just shows up, like in an alley at night, it's weird as F. 100 feet underwater at night is terrifying.
The beast was never clearly seen, but around 1992, while hunting a swamp just before dark here in Louisiana, I was stalk hunting while wading through knee-deep water. I saw water movement through some very thick hedgerow-like brush. At first, I believed it to be ducks, so I sneaked up to the edge of the brush for a clear shot. But when I got there, I could see movement through the thick brush six feet over the water, and at the same time, there were small wakes in the water coming through the brush every time it moved. I was less than ten feet from this animal, and I could hear it sniffing the air. It suddenly froze still when it picked up my scent. We were frozen in a noiseless standoff for at least two minutes. It couldn't see me, but it was looking for me because it knew I was very close. I knew this was something weird and my situation wasn't good. So while mostly hidden, I slowly and quietly over a minute or so replaced the bird shot in my 12 gauge with three three magnums as in buckshot. When I raised my gun to ready fire, it saw me, and when it did I believe it thought that I was closer than it expected, because that thing screamed like a wild hog, being killed x10 very hair raising loud. It then suddenly leaped several feet out of the water, and about 12 or so feet out into deeper water of about 8-10 feet deep. In that instant when it jumped I could see its back or something slightly above the brush, it had spiked hair. When it landed in the water, it sounded like a 300-plus pound animal splash. It remained underwater until it reached the other side of the slough. When it came out on land, I couldn't see it. I then made a huge circle around the animal to try and cut it off in an ambush. I wasn't really scared because even though it was God knows what, I knew I scared it more. I mean, I sneaked up less than 10 feet of this thing, and it had no clue I was even there until it winded me. Besides, at that range, a 12-gauge with that load of shots is like being shot 10 times with an AR-15 in one spot. A 12-gauge load like that can put a hole the size of your fist through a wild hog. That's an animal that has one of the toughest hides on the planet. There's nothing on this earth that will survive very long with a rib cage shot from that load at that range. I knew this already, that's why I give chase. Anyway, I tried ambushing with no luck. I wanted to continue hunting it, but all I had was a small pocket light, and it was only about ten minutes before total darkness. Before I set out of the swamp, I looked and found its tracks. I found canine-like tracks about four or five feet wide and six, seven foot long. They were bipedal tracks set about six feet apart due to the animal running. There's a lot more to the story, but I will leave it at this for now. I gathered enough info about this animal over the years that I'm convinced it can be hunted and killed. It walks on two legs and has canine-like feet, so it's whatever you want to call it. I just know it exists, and I see it more as an animal than a monster. My girlfriend's dad told us he was out moose hunting when they came across three guys from out of state looking to party before a wedding get drunk and have a good all time. They were loud as F for the next two nights to the point the dad's group went and checked it out. The groom had been tied up and was beaten because he cheated on his bride with one of his friend's significant others. After he was rescued, he told them they held a gun to his head and he was most likely going to be murdered in rural Alaska. My dad used to take me hunting on public hunting land in the late 80s, early 90s, and we would always, and I mean always, see the same affable elderly gentleman out there. The nicest man. A bird watcher. He would wear head to toe bright orange, so no one would mistake him as prey, and he stayed on the main roads and rode a bicycle. Just a fantastic human who spent hours talking to my dad about wildlife and life in general. All of game wardens in the area knew him, and so did most, of not all of the regular hunters. Again, this man never went into the woods, wore bright orange, which included a bright orange hat, and rode a bicycle. He practically glowed. One day, this wonderful man was found on the road, shot meticulously through the head. No one was ever arrested for his death. 
My father knew that no one could honestly state they thought he was a deer because of his precautions. We knew the poor man had been murdered. We never went hunting anywhere near there ever again. Three teenage witnesses were playing basketball from 6 to 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. The weather was clear and sunny, and they were across the street from a fire station in Fairview, New Jersey. While walking back to a friend's home, the reporting witness noticed that the area was empty of cars and people when normally there would be 50 to 100 people in the park. The witness stated that he observed rainbow colors out of the corner of his right eye. When he looked, he saw a shining silver metallic saucer with round tinted windows. He alerted his two friends who also saw the craft. He heard and felt whirring air and a roaring sound. His shirt was flapping as if in a five mile an hour wind, but there was no wind. They were paralyzed and could not run. They later arrived back at his friend's home with no memory of walking there. The witness discussed the incident with two friends, both now deceased, and they had no memory of being on the craft as he did. He recalls seeing them on operating tables, but he was standing approximately 30 feet away. The craft appeared larger inside than outside, possibly 400 feet across. About 25 creatures, approximately 4 feet tall, were present with about 10 to 15 around him and the rest around his friends. The creatures were gray in color with large round heads and large black eyes. The creatures were touching him all over. They were speaking telepathically and were surprised when they realized that he could hear them. His mother had previously told him that psychic abilities were common in their family, but he had never really believed it. He asked why they were there. His impression was that they were friendly and curious and meant no harm. He believed that they were trying to help his two friends who both had heart problems, and he believes that their lives may have been extended by the aid rendered on the craft. He remembers looking out the window and down onto the basketball court where they had been playing. He could see other beings moving about in long corridors. He remembers seeing the craft ascend after they had been returned. It moved up and to the right, then left, then up and away, leaving a rainbow-colored trail behind. When he returned to his home, his mother said he seemed changed, and he replied, It's no big deal, Mom. Before this report, he had only confided this story to his two daughters because he did not feel that anyone would believe him. I wasn't alone. I was working on a shrimp boat that was out to sea. Unbeknownst to me, most of the coastal shrimpers just go out for the day. For reasons unknown to me, our captain took us way the F out there. I think he said something about trying out new shrimping grounds. Anyway, we were heading into a storm turned out to be a Cat 2 hurricane, and the boat was rocking. We got our rescue here I and waited for the inevitable. It never came, but none have slept that night. It was eerie passing through the eye, totally calm while everything else raged around us. We had all made our peace. The next morning we had either gone through it, or we came back the way we came. Either way, we were on the edge of the storm. The captain was tired, so we took the day off. The first mate and I sat on the deck for a fair bit of the day, watching the last of the hurricane and the start of a new storm. We thought we had this smaller storm beat. We lowered the boom masts again and braced for heavy seas. The first mate brought along a bunch of weed and taught me how to roll a joint in your hand and how to smoke it. By this time is was getting late in the day and the storm was getting more energetic. Lots of thunder and lightning. We could see the reflective light and hear the thunder so we knew it was at least 10 miles out. The first mate, who was pretty stingy, otherwise rolled me a big old fat joint and told me to enjoy it. Of course I was in hog heaven. It never occurred to why the skinflint was sharing all this with me. He absolutely didn't have to, hadn't before, and wouldn't afterwards. At some point it dawns on me, so I ask why now, and not last night when I was wholly terrified in a life vest and high-vis ocean survival suit thing. 
He points off in the distance, and I see a little itty-bitty funnel cloud. Looks like a tornado. In the open water, they're called water spouts, and they're just as dangerous. So I get kinda worried. The first mate laughed and said, look around. There were at least 13 water spouts within a few miles of us. The first mate wasn't watching the storms. He was watching these water spouts pop up every so often, getting a little closer each time. By now, the captain is awake, and we're booking it anywhere but where we were. By the time all was said and done, we had gotten passed by three different spouts, got a rain of sand dollars, jellyfish, and a load of other ocean goodies. We had one go directly over us and touch down ten yards from the deck. I was scared of the hurricane, but these salty dogs were totally and completely terrified of the water spouts. It was and is by far the creepiest thing that's ever happened to me. Noises in the woods being followed by a black bear are all upsetting, but for some reason being in that boat at that time got under my skin. I am in the army and while training in Hohenfels, Germany. Our platoon was sitting on a screen line conducting an area reconnaissance mission. During the night, the guy on guard heard someone bang three times on the left side of the Bradley, which doesn't make sense because you would need another large metal object to make such a noise. Less than five seconds later, he heard the same three knocks on top of the turret. A few seconds pass and a high-pitched tone comes through the headset with three knocks on the back door of the Bradley along with someone screaming, Hey, let me in. This wakes me and one other up and we open the door thinking it's someone in our platoon who was trying to get in touch with us. There was only complete darkness. We waited about 30 seconds, geared up and checked a 50M semicircle around our Bradley finding nothing. We get back inside and every fault light in the turret is on with some blinking. They don't blink ever. The radios were also completely dead. We restarted the turret and everything worked fine. Called over the net to see if anyone was near our area and no one was. Next day we asked the OCS essentially referees and no one else was out the night prior. Shortly after we discovered an old tank half buried and rusted out near our position. We came to the conclusion that it must have been ghost Nazis. This was in an area where there was a clear cut on the far side of the ravine which had a creek running through it. There was a logging road where I camped. If I remember correctly, there was a sign attached to a tree stating Dualt 16. This was a few miles off the highway to Crater Lake and 50 miles from the parking lot at the Virginia domiciliary at White City. The sound I heard was a loud biwa, which I never heard before or since. It lasted perhaps three seconds and I could not determine the exact direction. I did not try to discover the source of the sound as there was thick underbrush. Earlier, there had been cattle in the area. Doors were tightly barred in Hong Kong as the search for a hairy beast unfolded. Terrified residents shared stories of a shaggy creature standing over six feet tall, sending waves of fear through the community. Among them was La Chu, a village gardener who had an encounter with the beast and lived to tell the tale. It was a day like any other when I found myself face to face with this mysterious creature. I was tending to my duties near the family temple, approximately 50 yards away, when the unthinkable occurred. Suddenly, out of the shadows, the beast appeared before me, its entire body covered in long, shaggy gray hair. To my astonishment, it stood upright, assuming a posture that resembled a human. Without a moment's hesitation, instinct took over, and I unleashed a powerful punch towards its stomach. The blow connected, causing the creature to momentarily falter. However, my triumph was short-lived as it swiftly fell upon me and we engaged in a desperate struggle. We grappled and wrestled, locked in a fierce battle for what felt like an eternity. Eventually, the creature abruptly disengaged, retreating into the distance, its form shifting as it loped away on all fours. 
I was left bewildered and shaken, trying to comprehend the surreal encounter that had just unfolded before my very eyes. The encounter had left an indelible mark on my psyche, forever etching the image of that shaggy beast into my memory. Not long after my encounter, the tales of this enigmatic creature continued to circulate. A woman reported witnessing a strange animal galloping past her vegetable garden, moving swiftly on all fours. As proof of her sighting, she presented large triangular footprints imprinted in the soft earth, distinctly different from those made by a human or an ape. The community was thrown into a state of uncertainty and fear as the search for answers intensified. Speculation swirled and theories were born, attempting to unravel the truth behind this hairy beast that had sent shockwaves through Hong Kong. As the days turned into weeks, the search for the creature continued, and the collective hope for understanding grew. But amidst the fear and uncertainty, there was also a sense of awe, a recognition that our world holds mysteries far beyond our comprehension. To this day, the memory of that encounter remains vivid in my mind. It serves as a constant reminder that in the vast tapestry of our existence, there are forces and creatures that defy conventional understanding, urging us to embrace the enigmatic wonders that lie hidden within our world. This happened about six months ago. Bit of background, I've grown up on boats and beaches. Family have always had a boat and I have always fished. However, this story didn't happen when I was out in the ocean. I was at a friend's house just after the moon had risen. It was a fairly bright night as I was sitting with a group of friends on a beach house deck. Anyway, none of us had actually taken any drugs or started drinking yet. We had just gotten back to the house. I remember looking out at the view of the beach and the moon. The bright moon was shining a fairly wide path from just below it across the water and onto the beach but all the other water was dark. You can imagine it like this. Although you could see the occasional wave break as the white wash caught some light. Anyway, I noticed a red light going from left to right. This is strange because a starboard green light should have been showing on that side of any boat at a cracking pace. Like it looked like some serious type of speedboat flying. I pointed this out to my friends and a few of us noted how quick and smooth this boat was flying across the bay. It eventually moved near the light of the moon, and as we all watched it fly past, it was literally just a red light, like a giant red ball. As soon as it hit the other side of the moonlight, it disappeared. I kind of assumed it was a drone, but it was seriously quick. It disappeared and was a long way out skimming what looked very close to the water on a surf beach. If anyone actually got this far, thanks for reading. The names in the following account are changed to avoid criminal prosecution. Both I and the man who told me of the incident are holders of now inactive top secret clearances issued by Department of the Navy Central Adjudication Facility. I don't know if the details of the incident are still classified. This is why I've changed the names. I apologize in advance for the cryptic nature of the story. However, I have known this man, I'll call him Jim, and served in combat with him for many years. I have and will stake my life on his integrity. People have been misled to believe that these are animals so it's okay to kill them. Some time ago Jim was sent on a tad temporary additional duty to a unit in Alaska. Most of the time there was spent on field daying at this or that location sitting around and passing scuttlebutt rumors about the nature of their purpose there. The official title is simply Security Force Training was conducted on target acquisition, field navigation, and winter survival alert drills were called almost daily. Jim and his platoon responded to the alert as always. Only this time the truck they had boarded started pulling out. He said they rode from 15 to 20 minutes to get out there in the middle of a huge valley, at which point they were told to follow an officer and a civilian guide. He and the others walked quickly at first for about a mile, and then were told to be quiet. 
They're also told to check their weapons standard M16s of 4s and one guy had an M40 and a 762 by 51 mm bolt action rifle. They were told they were there to kill an animal that was a threat to the compound and local residences. Jim told me that he had been on edge until that point because he didn't know what they were up against, but that a hunt for a bear or something was a relief. They spread out in a skirmished line and moved forward slowly and quietly with the guide about 20 yards in front of them. They had advanced that way about 150 yards when the guide stopped. They were just inside a tree line on the edge of a large meadow. As the line got to the guide, Jim said he saw what looked like a dark brown bear about another 50 yards into the meadow. The officer pointed to the bear and indicated that there was their target at that point. He and the others cycled the bolts on the rifles and took aim. That's when the bear stood up, only it wasn't a bear. He said it was about six feet tall with wide flat shoulders, not the sloping shoulders of a bear and the legs were too long to be a bear. Its head was humped and it had a long, and it had long arms that turned its head and looked at them. No one fired a shot. The thing grabbed something off the ground and started running away. That's when he saw the second one smaller, in his words about maybe four or five feet tall following the big one. They were quick too. The officer in charge hollered shoot and we opened fire. The first to go down was a smaller one. The big one stopped while still under fire and went back to the small one, dropped to a knee, and let out what Jim described as the cry of a mother over her dying child. I saw the hair on his arm stand up when he said, I kid you not. The rest of the story was told to me with his head down, unable to look me in the eyes. We stopped firing when the mother cried out, but the officer ordered us to kill it, so we resumed fire. The mother refused to leave the down child and took what he said was around 90 to 100 more rounds and she finally went down. No one moved forward but they stopped firing and reloaded. He said, we held our position for I don't know about 10 or so more minutes. That's when the officer started to walk toward it. The guy told him to stay there, wait, and give us some time to be sure it was dead. About an hour passed with no one talking he said we couldn't even look at each other. My gut was churning the whole time and I wanted to throw up. Finally the guide and the officer walked to the bodies and confirmed the kill. The rest of the platoon were not allowed to view the bodies but were ordered back to the truck. On the way back to the compound he saw other military vehicles heading toward the site. But they weren't from his compound. He said I don't know where they came from. I mean we were the only military in the area. Upon returning to the compound he and the rest of the platoon were debriefed one by one and told not to talk to anyone about the mission under threat of a life sentence in Leavenworth. Both Jim and I are retired and both our wives have passed so we don't have much to lose. It took a couple of shots of Jack Daniels and some other war stories to get to this one, but I swear every word is true. Jim doesn't lie and neither do I and I'll have words with any man who says this didn't happen. People need to know these are not animals. They are just as human as you or me. I don't know how they came to be and I don't care, I just want people to know. About 30 years ago, my five-year-old daughter and myself had been invited out to be a part of a friend's wedding party. The event took place at their family's rural summer camp in Halkirk, Alberta. We were there as a group preparing for the wedding a week ahead of time, and the women of the wedding party were being housed in a mobile home on the camp property. One night, just days before the wedding, I was awoken by a strange sound and upon opening my eyes I noticed a very bright beam of light shining in the curtainless window beside our bed. I sat up to investigate, and my first thought was that a helicopter was hovering in the sky above the home. But looking up I realized that what I was seeing was nothing like a helicopter or anything I had ever witnessed before. I saw what looked to be an almost silent, huge dark form hovering in the sky, humming slightly and shining a very narrow beam of light from quite a ways up directly into myself and my daughter. I froze, scared out of my mind 
I realized that what I was seeing was not anything my rational brain could figure out. I sat there stunned as minutes went by, and this object continued to hover without moving at all. I finally reached over and woke up my daughter, who instantly became frantic. I grabbed her from the bed, raced to another bedroom occupied by another bridesmaid, and woke her up to tell her what had happened. The next day I was sheepish to talk about what we had seen as the bride and groom were extremely Christian and conservative, and I thought that they wouldn't appreciate or approve of hearing my story. To this day I have never been able to forget that night, and I have never been able to sleep without closed windows and curtains pulled tight. I'm back home in the UK in my little cottage with my baby boy. I just put him down for a nap and I was pottering around when I developed severe pain in the tummy. I went down like a bag of potatoes. I couldn't stand, the pain was so intense that I thought I was dying. All I kept thinking of was my son and who would love him and care for him if I'm not here. After a few minutes, the pain went away as quickly as it came on. However, I contacted my doctors to book an appointment to check what was going on. My doctor examined me and my tummy was tender, so he sent me for an endoscopy, which is where they send a camera down your throat to have a look at what is going on. A week before my endoscopy, I had an amazing experience that I'll never forget. I woke up in the middle of the night and felt a presence in my room. I slowly shrugged it off and started to fall back to sleep. However, I became aware of three childlike alien beings on my bed. I didn't feel scared and I stood up and I held hands with two of them, one on one side of me and the other two aliens on the other side of me. My bedroom wall then started to spin and turned into a porthole and all four of us walked through. We came to a massive room with lines of computers and a large computer screen on the main wall, very much set up like a NASA mission control center but instead of humans at each computer, there were aliens. The room was white, everything was white, and on the large screen on the main wall, there was a famous male celebrity, and I knew they were studying this male celebrity. I then looked down at the aliens that I was with and instantly knew that these three little guys were also studying me, and that they knew far more about me than I did about myself. They had been studying me right from the beginning of my life on Earth. In the next scene, I remember I was lying on a medical bed, and there was another alien, which looked exactly like the childlike alien, but she was tall and adult-like. I knew she was female, and she spoke to me using telepathy. She started the operation, and I started to scream, and I mean scream, and she stopped what she was doing and told me off in a very stern way. She said the pain wasn't real, and that I actually can't feel anything and to be quiet. I did what she asked. She pulled two worm-like creatures out of my tummy. They wiggled and looked very much alive. I was shocked at what came out of me and disgusted. She said there was one left in my tummy, but for some reason she left it in there. The last scene I remember was being outside, sitting at a table with the three childlike aliens having a cup of coffee. Aliens were walking to what seemed like work and I was drinking coffee. I found it hilarious that they also had coffee and drank it like us humans. What I also found strange was that even though I was the only human there that I could see, no one gave me a second glance. It must have been common for them to see humans, I suppose. I went for my endoscopy a week later at my local hospital, and they just found inflammation of the stomach. However, I feel that these beings helped me in some way, and maybe even healed my stomach. I'm not 100% sure, but that is my conclusion at the moment. Even though this was my first conscious memory of being invited to an alien world, I feel I must have been there many times before. I'm not sure why I was allowed to remember that experience, maybe to help with the healing process. I would love to know what those worm-like creatures were and how they got into my stomach. The worm-like creatures they extracted from me remind me of the scene in the first Matrix movie, which I find interesting. I've driven the highways of this country for longer than I can remember, 
and I've seen my share of strange things on the road. So it was a lonely road, the kind where the only company you have is the hum of the engine and the soft glow of your dashboard lights. The radio had been nothing but static for hours, and my eyelids were growing heavy with exhaustion. That's when I saw him a hitchhiker standing by the side of the road, thumb outstretched, a silhouette in the darkness. At first, he seemed like any other weary traveler looking for a lift. He was dressed in worn-out jeans and a faded flannel shirt, a backpack slung over one shoulder. I pulled my rig to a stop and rolled down the window. Need a ride? I asked, my voice echoing in the silence. He nodded, a grateful smile on his face, and climbed into the cab. I could see his face now, a young man with tousled hair and tired eyes. He didn't say much, and I didn't press. I knew how it could be on the road, sometimes you just needed someone to share the journey. As the miles passed, I couldn't help but feel something was off. He was too quiet, too still. It was as if he was a shadow, a ghost of a person, just there but not really. I tried to shake off the unease that settled in my chest, blaming it on the fatigue that had been gnawing at me. Then, as we rounded a bend in the road, a pack of creatures emerged from the darkness. They looked like nothing I'd ever seen before half man, half dog, with matted fur, snarling muzzles and glowing, malevolent eyes. They blocked the road ahead, their growls and barks echoing in the night. I slammed on the brakes, my heart racing as I fumbled for my phone, thinking I had to call for help. But before I could even dial, the creatures lunged at the truck, clawing at the metal and snarling with ferocious hunger. Panic surged through me. Desperate, I turned to the hitchhiker, my voice trembling. What are these things? What do we do? But when I looked at him, I froze in terror. His face had changed, morphing into something twisted and ghastly. His eyes were hollow voids, and his skin was translucent like a ghost's. He reached out a hand, and it passed right through mine. With a cold, eerie smile, he whispered, I'm sorry. Before I could react, he vanished, leaving me alone in the cab with those nightmarish creatures clawing at the windows. I knew I had no choice but to put the pedal to the metal and drive. With a roar of the engine, I tore through the night, leaving the pack of dogman-like creatures behind in the rearview mirror. As I sped away, my heart pounding, I couldn't help but wonder if I had just encountered a ghostly hitchhiker or a malevolent spirit. One thing was certain I'd never pick up another hitchhiker on a desolate highway again. Not after the night I met the hitchhiker who vanished from an accident seen years ago, and the night the dogman-like creatures tried to tear me apart. On the day it happened, I was hiking on a small trail alongside a stream off of a forest road in Lassen National Forest in northeastern California. There were a couple of cars along the road, so I thought it would be a safe place for me to hop onto a small trail. I like to hike in some odd places, practicing my navigation skills with a map and a compass and my phone GPS app tracking my path. I like to pinpoint some unique land features on a topo map and go find them. I usually go with a group of orienteering friends, but that day I was hiking solo. When I'm alone, I don't go too far into the forest. However, the events of that day drove me deep into the forest. The stream was rather small compared to the actual stream bed, which was odd considering there had been a decent snowfall over the winter. I also noticed that there was a lot of algae in this stream, and a quarter mile and I could smell a rotting trout long before I came upon it. There were pieces of trash littered along the stream, I also came across a few small dead animals near the stream as I walked along the trail. It was disgusting, but I assume this is a popular area with teens or target shooters, and they probably left some trash behind. I didn't know that these were the warning signs of what I was walking into. About a mile in the trail diverged from the stream and cut through the shrubs and trees. I was close to my destination a spot along the stream that looked like it could possibly have a small waterfall. The trail turned left and it opened up to a large flat clearing. 
I stopped immediately, looking across the clearing. There was trash everywhere, and there were rows of cultivated dirt, but the plants were all uprooted. There was a holding pond lined with plastic sheeting along the stream, and there was a pile of sports drink bottles filled with a milky pink fluid next to it. Along the edges of the garden were what looked like homemade spike strips, boards with nails driven through them. I could smell the distinct odor of marijuana in the air. This was an illegal growth site. There had been enough news reports about what happens to people who come across these illegal growth sites for me to know that I needed to get away fast. I turned and I ran into the shrubs on the opposite side of the trail. Hiding behind a crumbling tree stump, I checked my map to make sure I was heading into uneven terrain where I would be unlikely to find another garden. The cars at the trailhead likely belonged to whoever was maintaining this garden, but since they weren't at this location, they were probably at another. I started to stand up, but dropped back down, holding my position when I heard a pair of male voices talking in Spanish. I recognized a few words like mountain and up when they were talking, and they kept repeating grand, grand. When their voices faded away, I quietly started to go in the opposite direction, putting distance between me and them. The map indicated that if I kept going east, there were no streams, and there would be some decent elevation changes. But afterward, there was a forest road I could follow. I walked straight through maintaining an eastbound path for half an hour, until I heard a soft wailing sound coming from the left of me. I stopped dead in my tracks. It sounded like nothing I'd heard in the forest before. It didn't sound like an animal, it sounded human. I could smell a strange odor in the air, and I noticed some long tracks on the ground that looked like a bare double step. But one side had splotchy blood in it. I grabbed my bear spray and knife out of my bag and stood still, looking around for the source of the noise. I took a couple of steps forward and everything went silent. Suddenly, I felt something crash into my left side from the rear knocking me to the ground. I looked up terrified that it was a bear, but it looked like a massive man covered in dirty blonde hair and very tan skin. He grunted at me and then collapsed on the ground. His feet near my face, I could see a massive gash in the sole of his foot with pine needles and dirt sticking to the blood that was oozing out. I heard voices coming from the direction I had just come from. I wasn't sure if it was the same men, but I didn't want to risk it. I jumped up on my feet, smacked his leg and said go, as loud as I dared. I started running east and I heard his limping footsteps pounding on the ground heading slightly north of me. There was a hill ahead with several large boulders that I could somewhat see through the thick trees. I continued running until I reached it. I climbed up the hill and I could smell that weird odor again. I followed the odor and I found the hairy man collapsed on his back on the ground. He was taking short rapid breaths. I could see that he had two holes in the far right side of his chest where there was blood oozing as well. He looked human yet he didn't. He looked like he could kill me single-handedly, but I had an overwhelming urge to help him. I knelt down beside him and grabbed his massive hand to try and check for his pulse. I could feel a strong beating under his skin giving me hope. He looked at me with eyes that seemed to ask for help. I pulled the first aid kit out of my pack and looked at what I had trying to figure out the best way to make what I had work. I keep my day kit light carrying only things that will patch me up enough to get to help. I only had two hemostatic gauze pads. The chest wounds were the most concerning. I put my ear near the wounds listening for sucking sounds, then applied the gauze when I heard none. I applied pressure for several minutes, then ripped two pieces of tape off of the roll to hold them there. His eyes were slightly open and watching me as I gestured for him to open his mouth. He closed his eyes with his mouth still shut. He could have indicated to me by now if he didn't want me touching him, so I went for it. I carefully pulled open his mouth to check his gums and tongue, keeping my fingers clear in case he decided to snap his mouth closed. His gums were dark, but his tongue was pink. I didn't see any signs that his lungs had been punctured, but when I looked at his teeth, they weren't quite like a human's. 
His canine teeth were larger, but not as oversized as a gorilla's. Once the critical injury was dressed, I went down to work on his foot, washing it gently with some water from my pack. He started moaning, lifting his head up and looking at me, but he didn't jerk his foot away. I did my best trying to clean it out using one of my maxi pads to wipe away the debris and dry the skin. The cut was long nearly an inch deep across most of it, and there was a hole on the top of his foot as well. His foot was very broad and flat and the wound was trying to splay open. I filled the cut with ointment and used the tape to make massive butterfly strips to pull the two sides of the wound together, leaving drainage gaps between the strips. I left the hole on top uncovered to serve as a drain as well. I then took my last maxi pad and strapped it to the bottom of his foot like a sandal using tape across the top. I looked back up at his face and I could see a small trickle of blood running on the ground by his head. I had missed a wound someplace. I went back to his side and pulled on his arm, hoping he would get the idea to roll over. He was too heavy for me to pull over without his help. Finally, he rolled onto his side and I found two jagged exit wounds on his back, about the size of my thumb. I didn't have much left in my first aid kit but I did have several tampons. I opened up the tampon package and put the applicator in about an inch deep and inserted the tampon leaving about a third of it outside of his body. I repeated this in the other hole and then pulled on his arm to get him on his back to keep pressure on the tampons. Once he was flat again, he closed his eyes and his breathing slowed down. He seemed to be sleeping. I stayed there watching him for a few minutes and cleaning up my trash when I heard shots in the distance. I needed to get down to where I could find help, but I couldn't leave him exposed. My cell phone didn't have service at this point, so I needed to get down to the road. I didn't think it was likely whoever was shooting the gun would come up the hill, but I gathered up the few branches I could find and covered him with them, hoping he would stay sleeping until I came back. I started down the hill on the eastern side heading towards the forest road. Once I hit the flat dirt, I ran south until I saw a truck heading down the road towards me. I could see the light bar on top, and I felt so relieved at that point. I knew I was safe. The ranger pulled up to me, and I broke down relieved. I knew I couldn't come right out and talk about the Sasquatch. Instead, I told the ranger about the illegal grow and I said that I saw a severely wounded bear with young cubs they had shot. It was a lie, but I needed him to go back with me and check on him, and he probably wouldn't believe me if I said what he really was. We drove back to the hill, and we ascended where I hid him. The ranger was following close behind me with his gun drawn. The ranger wanted me to follow behind. I wanted to make sure I was the first face the Sasquatch saw. He likely wouldn't survive another gunshot wound, and if he slammed into the ranger as he did to me, the ranger would likely shoot. When I was able to see the top of the hill, I could see the branches, but he was gone. The blood from his back was still there, but the branches I'd covered him with were arranged into an X on the ground. It's been six years since that day, but I feel like it was yesterday. Since I didn't see him get his injuries, I'll never know for certain what happened. I've read stories about them being protectors of the forest, and I think that's what he was doing. These illegal growers divert water from streams to grow pot, and their camping garbage brings a lot of wildlife to their gardens. They use highly potent and sometimes illegal rodenticides and insecticides and large die-offs are common around growth sites, everything from birds to bears. It would make sense that he would want to push them out of his forest. I'm certain he was shot, and I think when he was running away he stepped on a spike strip and it ripped through his foot. I did my best to take care of him, and I wish I knew he was okay out there. I was camping at a popular campground in the mountains with my boyfriend. But it was November, and it was their last open weekend, so no one was there. We were chatting and having a good time around the campfire and drinking. My boyfriend had to go pee so he walked to the other side of the road and peed in the bushes. 
While over there, he very slowly and quietly got my attention and pointed out the large glowing eyes staring back at him from the bushes. He still has his D out while in a stare off with a mountain lion. We very carefully backed up and stayed really close to the fire until we went to bed in the car instead of the tent. We could hear it walking around after we went to bed that night. The worst part was I went to find the pit toilet 15 minutes before this all happened. By myself. I even got slightly lost while trying to find it and was probably being stalked by the cougar. I've been pretty nervous camping ever since. I saw an elf or leprechaun, so I went off trail and started aimlessly wandering in the general direction of a peak in the Uintas. From up a steep slope and from behind some very thick tree line, I started getting pelted with green pine cones. Those shits hurt. They were flying at me from quite a distance, and I tried to angrily chase down the source, but the terrain was was too difficult to negotiate quickly. I didn't see one shape or even the hint of movement through the trees at all. It's like the pine cones were coming from absolutely nowhere and arcing perfectly through thick trees and nailing me almost unerringly. Not a one hit a single tree or branch, and that would have been impossible for me to do. Worst part? I could hear faint, high-pitched, creepy laughter. When I was about 10 years old, my mom had her second kid. We didn't have a ton of money, so it wasn't uncommon for our cars to break down or need to be repaired. Well, one day my mom, my baby sister, and I were heading to my aunt's house. She lived kinda up in the mountains, so to get there we had to take a pretty steep inclined highway, then it veered off into the more rural area where my aunt lived. About halfway up the incline, my mom's car started to sputter. We could feel the car giving out, and I remember my mom just trying to get the car as close to the exit as possible. Well, the car didn't make it, and we broke down on the side of the highway. This was before cell phones were popular, so the only way to get help was to walk to the nearest payphone. We were probably about half a mile or so away from the exit, and right off that exit was a gas station. My mom told me to get as close to the guardrail as possible, and we began walking. Within a few moments, a man pulled up beside us and asked if we needed a ride. My mom cradled my sister, shoved me to the side, and quickly said, No to the man. She did that hip bump thing that people do, and at first I was like WTF because if I would have fallen over the rail, I would have tumbled down a pretty steep hill. But then I looked over and very clearly saw a gun on the man's front seat. It was half covered with a handkerchief, but it was clearly a small handgun. He pulled it closer to him and tried to fully conceal it, but both I and my mom had already seen it. He drove slowly beside us trying to convince my mom to get in the car, but my mom just kept saying no but she wasn't rude or mean about it. Calm as a clam, just friendly as could be. He finally pulled off as we got closer to the exit. I'm guessing he wanted to stay on the highway. Once he pulled off, my mom looked at me and said he was going to kill us. She was still eerily calm as F. My name is Ataraxia and I'm in high school. Last year, I went through a bad episode of depression. I'm doing much better currently, and I was scrolling on TikTok and found a video of a girl who claimed she shifted into another reality in her sleep. At that point in my life, going to another reality even just for a few hours a day sounded great to me. Out of curiosity, I looked up tutorials and other info on YouTube, and it soon became an obsession. For about eight whole months, I dedicated my free time to learning how to shift. The shifting I am talking about is not the kind where people say they went to an anime or Hogwarts or whatever. My desired reality, as they call, it was just a normal world where some of my problems did not exist. Since there are infinite realities that are similar to ours, I hope to reach one with those qualifications. On February 8, 2023, I decided to try shifting. 
I wrote down the date of when I went to sleep and the details of my desired reality. I tried my best to hold my vision of me waking up in that desired reality for as long as I could, but I fell asleep and had a dream of my previous day at school. I don't think the dream had to do with anything just adding it. I woke up disappointed and grabbed my phone to turn off my alarm, and I saw that my wallpaper was different. I thought it was weird, but I thought maybe I changed it accidentally somehow, because the new wallpaper was an old one I had not too long again. Then things started to get strange as I got ready for school. Things were very slightly different. The pink pot on my desk no longer had the Kirby face I painted on it. My shoes were in a different cubby than I placed them in. I go to a private school so I place my school shoes in a top cubby so that they are easier to reach. I no longer had a paper cut on my thumb. My blazer was wrinkled and in the laundry even though I washed it and ironed it on Monday which would be February 6, my jewelry dish was gone and instead my earrings were just on my nightstand. Those are just a few of the differences I can remember right now. I instantly thought about the shifting thing I tried last night, and assumed the worst which is I am in another reality. I continued on with my day and I found out that no, my problems were not gone, so this was not my desired reality. School was different too. The road lines were much more worn out than usual on the way. Someone who I didn't know personally waved at me at school. I hit my hip really hard on a bench that I have never seen while turning my usual corner pretty fast to get to bio class. Our school banner in the courtyard was different. My assigned seat for religion class was different. My apps on my laptop were arranged differently. A character I had recently gotten in a gacha game was no longer on my account and the currency count was different game was Honkai Impact 3rd and the character missing was Hersher of Truth and a bunch of other small changes that I don't distinctly remember. All I could think about all day was the fact that I was somewhere different and I was not home. I have never been one to be overly stressed and have panic attacks, but the stress was overwhelming and crushing. My head and eyes were hurting by the time I got home. When I got home, I went to bed and tried to shift back. I wrote on a piece of paper home over and over again and put it under my pillow shifting method and set it in my head and imagined myself waking up at home again. I fell asleep and woke up. I started crying from relief when I saw my Kirby pot with a face again. The experience felt surreal to me, almost like a really vivid dream and I was very willing to peg it off as one. That's when I checked the date on my phone. It was Friday, February 10th. This meant I spent a day somewhere else. My friend that I didn't recall being with much yesterday. As I spent my two breaks in the bathroom panicking at school, even asked me if I was alright, and that she was worried about me. Last night since I had been acting different and was very stressed out yesterday, she knows that I am struggling with depression. I said it was nothing and that I was perfectly fine. Does this mean that I switched consciousnesses with another me? And if that was the case, did we both try to shift that same night? Or was it just me? Did I shift? Was this a dream? Was it something else? Either way, I took this as a sign to never try shifting ever again. I spent about six months last year essentially volunteering on organic farms in exchange for room and board. One of the farms I stayed at was actually an off-the-grid homestead near Mount Hood, Oregon, populated by shamanic hippies who had some wild stories themselves. And while not remote, was deep enough in the mountains that we had no neighbors for at least ten miles in every direction. Beautiful forested land with an amazing view of Mount Hood from the garden. I was camping every night for about two weeks before weird things started happening. The first bizarre occurrence happened not to me, but to a fellow friend who I'll call Jay. Now I am not particularly outdoorsy. I grew up in the woods in North Florida and spent my formative years getting lost in places I shouldn't be, but I don't have a great deal of camping experience and only the most basic survival skills. I am comfortable in the woods, but only until sunset. 
Jay, a true outdoorsman, had been a forest ranger in the Alaskan bush for two years prior and frequently went on weeks-long solo backpacking trips. He had shown up at the farm a few days after me and had set up camp over a mile further down the mountain than I had, which I initially thought was a dickish move but later came to appreciate because he played his harmonica at all hours and nobody needs to hear that shit. He was a slow-talking Minnesotan that favored all things logical. One morning, we met up for breakfast, and he asked me if I had heard all that screaming the night before. I hadn't. He told me that he had been laying in his tent with his headlamp on, reading a book when he heard a deep, rumbling scream just outside his tent. He turned his lamp off to listen more closely, and realized that his entire tent was illuminated from the outside, as if someone was aiming a floodlight at it. In the few seconds after he turned his headlamp off, two things happened in rapid succession. The screaming cut off as if someone had flipped a switch, and the light from outside clicked off. He listened for footsteps, but heard nothing. After a few moments of silence, he turned his headlamp back on and left his tent to investigate, because I guess he had never seen a horror movie in his whole Gotham life. He said that there was nothing in the clearing and no movement from the surrounding forest, even though he hadn't heard anything leave, and the scream had been very close to, if not within, his camp. Then he apparently shrugged to himself and went to sleep, or maybe he passed out in fear and was too much of a man to admit it. He told me this over breakfast and I was horrified. He said he'd never heard an animal that sounded like that and could not explain the light except that maybe a hunter had found their way onto our land. But then where did they go? He listened for footsteps and heard nothing. He didn't seem worried, just a bit perturbed. It was very Minnesota of him. Everything was quiet for a few weeks after that incident. Jay left for another farm, and I remained in my old campsite, only about three quarters of a mile down from the main cabin. I was comfortable in my tent and no longer jerked awake at broken twigs or animals moving through the brush. I was very proud of myself, look at me, an outdoors woman. Which was, of course, when the screaming started. I was laying in my tent, just on the edge of sleep when it started. It was a deep, low roaring. Unlike any animal I knew to live in the mountains in that region, I consoled myself by saying it was an injured black bear a messed up wolf, some kind of Lovecraftian mutant elk. Then, from farther down the mountain, something else began screaming, answering. The two whatevers shrieked at each other for the better part of an hour. I laid in my tent, trying to psych myself up to hike back up to the main cabin, but couldn't quite commit. I laced up my boots and put on my headlamp in case I had to make a run for it. Eventually, the screaming stopped and I somehow managed to sleep. I woke up somewhere around 4 a.m. to something very large shuffling in the bush directly behind my tent. I laid in the dark and listened, absolutely terrified. Elk bear? It was too large. I could hear it ruffling branches of trees at least six feet off the ground. I heard it take a step, and then another. Bipedal? Human? Hunter? A hunter would never be as loud as this thing was, and I seriously doubt they would disturb an obvious campsite. Besides, in the month I'd been on the homestead at that point, I'd never heard a gunshot. I'd never seen anyone other than the people I was working with this far up the mountain, for that matter. I laid there, considering my options. It moved slowly, like it was picking through the bushes behind me. Which, in retrospect, of course it was, I'd camped right next to Wild Blackberry. I laid and listened and waited for a long time, almost until sunrise. It was moving slowly down the mountain. I laid in my tent long after the noise died out. When I finally managed to rally my nerves and leave my tent, the brush behind my tent was obviously disturbed. I thought about investigating, looking for prints, droppings, but decided I'd rather just repress the whole thing and deal with it when I was far, far away from these woods. At breakfast, I asked my host, Anne, about the screaming. She was delighted that I'd had a run-in with the forest people. She said that years ago, when they'd moved onto the land, 
The forest people would get into their garden and make a mess of things, so she'd started leaving baskets of produce for them as a sign of goodwill. They'd left the garden alone since. Then I camped out for another week before it got too cold, and I moved into the main cabin, and never heard anything weird again. Pretty anticlimactic, but I guess real life usually is. Still very bizarre and interesting. As a lifelong student of all things esoteric, it verified a lot of suspicions I had. Mostly that weird shit happens in the woods. It's also pretty telling that everyone I met in the Cascades, granted most of them were of the shamanic, metaphysical persuasion, had a Sasquatch story. There were a few other strange things about that place, but this story is by far the most interesting. Oregon is a weird, wonderful place. I woke up to the sound of footsteps outside my bedroom door. My heart was pounding as I tried to listen carefully. The footsteps seemed to be getting closer. I was paralyzed with fear, wondering who could be walking around my house at this time of night. I quietly slipped out of bed and peered through my bedroom door, trying to catch a glimpse of whoever or whatever was walking around my house. But the darkness was too thick and I couldn't see anything. Suddenly, I heard a loud creaking noise, and I realized that someone was opening the door to my bedroom. I didn't know what to do. Should I run or confront the person? But as the door opened, I saw nobody there. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and my heart was racing even faster than before. I slowly walked towards the door, trying to be as quiet as possible. My hands were shaking, and my mind was racing with fear and confusion. Was this a dream, or was someone really in my house? As I stepped out of my room, I could hear a strange noise like a soft whisper coming from the darkness. It sounded like someone was breathing heavily right outside my door. My heart was pounding so hard that I couldn't think straight. I stumbled backwards and ended up falling down the stairs. I felt myself tumbling downwards, seemingly in slow motion, until I hit the bottom with a loud thud. I looked up to see a shadowy figure standing over me, and my heart stopped. I couldn't move or scream. The figure slowly started to take shape, revealing itself to be a person, but their face was completely covered. I couldn't see who it was, but I knew I was in danger. I tried to crawl away, but the figure caught up to me and reached out, grabbing me by the hair. I screamed in terror, but no sound came out. I felt like I was drowning in my own fear as the figure slowly dragged me towards my bedroom. That was the last thing I remembered before waking up in the hospital. The doctors told me that I had suffered a concussion, but I couldn't help thinking about who or what had come into my house that night. The memory of those footsteps, the whispers in the darkness, and the figure that had haunted my nightmares ever since has never left me. To this day, I still wonder what could be lurking in the shadows of my home, waiting to strike again. First time hunting about six years ago in my early 20s. I was with two friends from high school that I hadn't seen in a few years. One of the guys, say his name is Freddy, had gone silent on me and my other friend, let's say Jacob. Freddy came back into town and went drinking with Jacob. Jacob calls me saying Freddy is back and wants to go camping. Turns into hunting pretty quick. Here's the weird part. Freddy had this unmistakable scar over his eye, like he'd been in a fight with a guy and like the movies. The knife was pressed down. I'd asked Jacob and he hadn't checked as to why. But we found out pretty quick the guy was nuts so who knows. Freddy says he remembered hunting there with his dad. Mind you, we were supposed to be camping. He said the location was just up the way. A few shots of tequila and about five more just up the ways and Freddy stops. He looks back. I realize it's twilight and darkness is falling on us fast. Freddy, Jacob, I think this is where it happened. Jacob looks back at me, bewildered. Jacob. What's that man, Freddy, where it almost killed me? About that time, the tequila buzz amped up and I laughed out loud. 
Turns out Freddy didn't like this and took off running. We try to catch up, but he's like gone gone. So drunk Jacob and I had to pop open our easy setup tent and stay the night in Bum F, Montana. Jacob and I start talking about Freddy, his history, the I, and where the F he went to. Throughout the night we heard what we thought for sure was him. Same cough and all. We start laughing about old times and must have passed out. I hear a zipper and see a dim light through the film of the tent. It's Freddy. Hey guys, get the F up. I'm freaking out. Buzz had worn off, but Jacob and I were totally confused. Freddy. My friend Sam doesn't believe me when I tell him I got friends. Or something to that effect. Sam turned out to be a deep woodsman from the back country. A true hillbilly hick in every sense. Dude smelled like compost and I couldn't see much of him, just silhouette. Jacob pulls a gun and tells them to F off. We get out, leaving everything behind. I was still a bit too drunk to process what happened. The sun comes up and we hit the main road again after what was probably two hours if walking. I sober up completely and Jacob tells me something that I still remember. He said he never drank the tequila, only I did, and that when I started rambling all weird, he knew Freddy had slipped us something. Freddy never had a friend with him, turns out I hallucinated it. I guess he had slipped me something that made me hallucinate all the conversations and everything. The one accurate part I got right was Freddy had taken off running, but it wasn't long. He came back, telling Jacob he led us out there to hunt us and wanted us to run. Jacob pulled his gun he had packed against my wishes and freaked old Freddy out, and he ran off for good. It was a rough end to what was a decent friendship in school. No telling what his scar was from and what happened to him, but we clearly lost all contact, and I bought Jacob a real shot of tequila after we got back into town the next weekend. He saved me. The kicker was he didn't even have any bullets in the gun. He said he forgot to load it. Still freaks me out. This story almost belongs on no sleep but I swear it's real. Hiking along a section of the PCT with my aunt and dog after three days, we found ourselves at an impassable river crossing with the dog and have to head back. Reluctant to go over the mountain passes we just did, we pulled out our map and find what seems to be an interesting trail through the Ansel Adams wilderness to that will put us back where we started. We go to a resupply point, got some dinner and a shower, and ask if we can get a four-wheeler right up the road to the trailhead. They say nobody goes up that road and we couldn't get one, but a man on vacation with his family offers to help up out. We drive about two miles up the road and it proves to be so washed out. It becomes impossible to drive further, so we then him for his help and continue on foot. We walk another three miles or so to the trailhead and find it completely destroyed by fallen over trees and it looks like no one has been there for decades. Turns out this was an old logging road used in that area before it became a wilderness area 50 or 60 years ago. So we start hiking down the, the trail another four miles until we camp for the night. Along this trail we see nothing but bear tracks and deer tracks. No people tracks, horses, or anything. We even stumble on a bear in the middle of taking a dump on the side of the trail and scare him off. From our camp, the road or trail gets really tough. It was about six miles of climbing over giant fir trees, one after another. We finally reached an opening and followed it for about another mile until amazingly we couldn't believe it. But we came up on a two-story building way out there in the middle of nowhere, 15 miles from the nearest people and 50 from any civilization. This place was super eerie. The house was straight out of the Blair Witch, and it must have been there since before it became a wilderness area. This where thing got weird. We found a sign here for our trail that pointed directly into thick brush and bushes. This is when we knew we were a little screwed. We decided that we should just go for it anyway. We were too far to turn back now and luckily we had a GPS to help guide us even without a trail. So we go through the bushes and follow what used to be a trail. 
We get about another mile or so down the trail before I notice barefoot human prints. Let me remind you that I've been seeing bear prints and cougar prints along this trail the whole time. These were human. I put my size 11 hiking shoe over it, and they were the same size and shape and asked my aunt if I was going crazy and she agreed it was human. We walked another 500 yards down the trail with human prints, leading us to what looked like either a dump or a homeless camp. There was a tarp strung up, trash bags piled up, and garbage scattered all over next to the creek. Nope, F that. No more investigating this creepy place in the middle of nowhere. We just hiked as fast as we could continuing up the hill and away from that place as possible with the eerie feeling that someone was watching us for miles. We continued the way we did hiking with no trail for another 12 miles until we reached a maintained trail on the other side of the pass along some really pretty areas that probably haven't been seen in years. But seeing a homeless Bigfoot camp in the middle of nowhere was not one of them. However, when I was younger, my father bought a plot of reclaimed coal mines land. It was quite literally in the midst of hundreds of acres of wilderness. Me and my younger brother would play in the woods around our house and we found some interesting stuff. There was an old wooden wagon that was broken down and rotting that we found. We also found what looked like the remnants of an old cable pulley system with wooden buckets attached to it. The thing that scared me the most happened to me and my best friend at the time. We were outside playing basketball when these shadowy figures appeared at the edge of the forest. There were four of them and they were completely black except for their eyes. It was like a pinprick through paper that when you shine a light on it, the paper is the shadow and hole is this area of light. That's what their eyes looked like. They knew us by name and called out to us. They were calling us over to them. We ran away into the house and didn't come out for a long time. This happened when I was eight or nine years old and I guess I repressed it. But I kept having this memory of these shadow people and my friend. At first I thought it was just a dream that I'd had, but the memory was persistent. When I was much older, I believe mid-twenties, I was with my friend and told him that I had a question that I needed to ask him. I told him that it was going to sound crazy, but it happened while we were playing basketball when we were younger. He instantly answered saying the shadow people at the edge of the woods. It completely threw me. He verified that it had truly happened without me really asking about it. It still shakes me to this day when I think about it. Home for summers during college friends and I would often grab a couple of 12 packs and drive off into the woods somewhere and have a little fire. Nothing crazy, just a few beers and shooting the shit. Our normal spot had gotten blown up Someone had blocked off the road, so we decided to go off in the woods on my friend's farm. There was no road, so we are just walking through the woods in the dark, looking for a good spot when we hear coy dogs howling in the distance. Then we hear coy dogs howling from behind us. Eventually, they are howling all around us and clearly getting closer. We noped the F out and ran back to the car. I was walking on the Jedediah Smith Redwood State Park in the Stout Memorial Grove. It is approximately one mile in circumference. I was going to go to the left and circle around, but there were two young guys that started to walk off trail to a big tree, so I went to the right. I thought it was the two guys messing around, but I didn't hear any laughter after it. The hair on my arms stood up after I heard screams. I turned around immediately to leave because it was getting late, around 6.40 p.m., and the sun was starting to set. About 20 feet back down the trail, I noticed a black figure standing about 120 feet from where the two young guys were standing earlier. At first, I thought it was a bear standing up because it was about 7 feet tall and backlit by the sun. The face was partially obscured by a branch, and it was too far away to detect an odor. I took two quick photos of it and left. 
I didn't realize what I had photographed until later when I reviewed the photos. Unfortunately, they're bad, so I won't post them here. Also, the creature was strikingly all black. Seven foot tall animal standing on hind legs. Its weight looked to be between 250 to 400 pounds and looked like a bodybuilder. It had a long muzzle, long pointed ears with tufts on them, really long arms with a big chest and a smaller waist. A branch covered a portion of its face. It was about 30 yards away. This was not a bear, it looked like a werewolf. It was on a hot summer night that I was out in the dark woods with my neighbor, whom I'm pretty close with. He was like extended family, honestly. The fact that I didn't even know we were going until that night when I was sitting at home in front of my laptop playing video games. My neighbor came over to see me, and he asked me if I wanted to go camping with him and his family. It had been a while since we last did anything together, so of course I said yes. It would have just given us an excuse not to go to school for a couple of days. This was in September, so school had just started back up, and the coldness of fall had not yet come, so it was perfect. The next day, his family and I gathered our camping gear. We're driving down a dark road with tall trees on the other side of it. It was getting dark quickly, so we had to turn the lights on, unfortunately, which means we would have had to set up in the dark. So we're driving for about an hour, but it felt like it took forever. My friend's dad turned left at an unmarked intersection where there wasn't even a sign saying that this was the right turn off the road. The road got bumpy and rocky as he drove over this very raw, unpaved road. That's when we came across a large clearing because all I could see around was trees and darkness. Where we stopped at this makeshift campground, I say that because there was no clear indicated spot to set up a tent, a spigot, a bathroom, or anything. This was truly camping just down the middle of nowhere, perfect. Now I need to say that it was pitch blackout, and it had gotten really cold now that the sun had set, but we were all so higher up in elevation, so we got everything set up quickly and decided we would huddle up in the tent together that my friend's father had set up for us but I just had this feeling lingering within me that we weren't alone. Now my brain was playing tricks on me, so I decided to step out and get some fresh air. It was eerily quiet until I heard this screaming noise. My heart began pounding fast as if it knew what was coming. Then we heard a wrestling noise in the bushes, more screaming from the woods. I was so scared that my friend told me to come back into the tent. Now not only could we all hear the noises, but then as I got back in the tent and we shined our light, we could see something moving outside the tent. This shape, my friend's dad got a flashlight shining at it. That's when this thing begins screaming and thrashing. Now we're all yelling, freaking out because we can see the shape of this thing more. It looked like an animal, but all we could see was this large shape, and it was terrifying. Looking from the silhouette, it looked like an upright deformed reindeer or something, and it had long claws. It was where we being pranked. I wasn't even sure. It screamed again in our direction, and we just prayed for it to leave. It walked around our tent, and we all kept our flashlights shining at it through the tent material, only revealing its silhouette. But one thing I noticed is it never came closer to the tent. It's like it was pissed that we set up camp here in its area. I get it. This probably sounds like some sort of amateur creepypasta, but tell it to my family, my friend's family, and me who have to deal with the memory of this thing. We stopped hearing it almost literally after we all pretty much urinated all over our sleeping bags out of terror. Surprisingly, none of us had any weapons on us. Somehow we all forgot. We got lucky that night, but who knows what would have happened if it were to come back and possibly check out our tent. Now of course my friend's dad regrets that he didn't bring any weapons. He forgot. He normally always carries a pistol. I went home the next day and we didn't get any sleep that night. What was designed to be a civil day trip turned into a quick overnight terror. I've not been able to go camping since. I don't think I ever will, you know. 
and I'm also not sure what this thing was or where it came out of. I haven't really sat down to try and research either. I don't really care. I just want to get rid of this memory. The encounter only lasted a few seconds, but it was one of those, what the F am I sharing airspace with moments. He was in the US Navy flying P-3's subhunters back in the 80s, and was on one of his many flights jumping from one island to another way out in the Pacific. At one point he was on another one of his long hauls somewhere over the ocean hundreds of miles away from anything. At around one or so his co-pilot spotted some kind of aircraft coming from the right side well ahead of them at a much lower altitude. It didn't have any position lights on or anti-collision lights, just a few night formation light strips. They could only see a bit of moonlight reflecting off it, but could tell it was something somewhat small-ish, as in not a bomber, sleek, and definitely not a B-2. Going by how it looks after the fact. This debuted in 97 or F-117 or any other plane he recognized but it looked like it would have been a stealth fighter or attack plane for sure. My dad flashed his landing lights to basically say, Hi, we're flying here. Daffuck you doing? At this point the other plane turned off its green nighttime navigation lights and visibly picked up its pace. They got one last look at its moonlit features before it went under their nose. There was no trace of it after that. They flew the rest of the trip assuming they were being monitored very closely. Nothing ended up happening, and they didn't tell anyone or so he tells me. If anything else did happen, he probably isn't allowed to say. He was 100% positive it was military, but he has no idea what. Whatever it was, he clearly wasn't meant to see it, and he was flying right above it. Hundreds of miles away from civilization and thousands away from the mainland. Edit, and I should also clarify. The B-2 obviously wasn't out at the time this happened, but it was when he told me this. Knowing how it looked after the fact, he was sure it wasn't a B-2. I'm a police officer, so I had just finished my shift and was on my current way home. I had stopped off at Wendy's to grab a quick bite to eat. It was right around midnight, so the drive through was pretty dead. As I went through the line, I saw this thing just standing there, watching me from across the parking lot. Not sure what it was, but it looked really tall and skinny, with gangly arms and legs hanging out. It gave me this very uneasy feeling, and I watched it as it turned and walked away over to some shrubbery behind one of those big light poles by the parking lot exit and entrance. I try not to think too much of it and just drove away. There's just something about what I saw that still really spooked me. I feel very unsettled in my stomach just thinking back to it. As I was getting home from work, I was still shaken up. I could not stop thinking about what I saw, so I decided to show my son and daughter 8 and 10, who were getting ready for bed, about what had rattled me so badly. Not that I could actually show them, but at least tell them. My kids kind of just looked at me like I was crazy, but being kids, I found they would believe me a lot more than my wife would. Then they started telling me about Slenderman, which sounds like it might be what I saw, but I don't know any of these creepopasta characters kids watch nowadays. Could you kindly give me any information on what do you think I saw, and was this paranormal or not? God, I really want to tell this to people. So a few months ago, my girlfriend and I went to a public state park. It is not like a middle of nowhere, but still not many people around, and it was in the afternoon that a strange thing happened. When we were heading out of the park, we saw a car that was traveling on the opposite side toward us. Then the car turned right, it was a sedan. We thought there was a road right there. And when we got to the section where that car turned, we didn't see any road, but only high grass and big trees. I asked my girlfriend, Did you see that red car just now? I thought it turned right around here. She said, I saw a car too, but it was white, wasn't it? 
We look at each other's for a few seconds and quickly left that area. That was weird. Visiting a friend in California. My last night there and we're talking about how I hadn't seen any redwoods. So we hop in the car at 11 o'clock at night and head off to some forest trail that he knows. We get there and there is a gate with a sign on it which we don't read. He's carrying his toy poodle. We walk a little ways but the trees aren't that big. He says they get bigger further in and sparks up a joint and we keep walking. Maybe a half mile and we hear the loudest scream I have ever heard. We stop and looked at each other and my friend says, I think someone just got murdered. We stood there for a few minutes to see if we heard anything else, and then we heard it again. It seemed to be closer, but it was tough to tell as it was echoing. Still no clue what it is, but we decide we should probably get out of there. Didn't really think much of it afterwards until I read an article about a mountain lion stalking someone, and there was audio of the sound mountain lions make. I send the link to my friend saying I think we are lucky to be alive. He laughs and says, You know I was up that way recently and noticed that the sign on the gate is a warning for mountain lions in the area. I was fishing in this little pond in the woods near my buddy's house. I heard a growling from across the water, but it was a really deep growl. I look up and I saw what can only be described as a Sasquatch. It was looking right at me from across the lake, which is about 100 feet away. Then it dropped on its belly and I want to say crawled away because that was the motion, but it was super fast. Reminded me of a liquor from Resident Evil. I literally peed my pants and whimpered a little and was in shock for a moment. I never told a soul because who would believe me? I've received many strange, bizarre calls as an officer. This is one of them. The call came in as a woman reporting to the police that she had heard and seen a large dog trying to break into her home. She sounded frantic. It told me she saw the creature trying to get in through her door several times before dialing 911. The dispatcher asked if the animal was actually inside her home. She told us no. The dispatcher asked if this thing was trying to get inside her house. She said yes and told the dispatcher that this was a large, vicious dog, larger than any dog she'd ever seen before. This continued on for several minutes until I finally arrived on the scene. I got out of my car and walked towards the house, flashlight in hand and ready for anything. Then I knocked on the front door. I waited several seconds and there was no response. I knocked again, still nothing. So I walked around the back of her home to see if she had gotten out another exit or entrance. I didn't want to break down her door. Maybe she wasn't in danger after all. About halfway up the driveway at the side of her house, I noticed a large missing section of fence that looked to be torn down, leading right off to the woods and the property next door. Then it occurred to me there were also large canine tracks that led over this fence right in the dirt, leading up to the house. As I crouched down, shined my flashlight, and began trying to investigate, I saw something that will haunt me forever. Growling at me from less than 20 feet away was a snarling wolf-like creature, standing on two legs right by the tree line leading off into the woods. This creature lowered its head and growled, and then jumped off quickly into the darkness of the forest. I had my gun drawn and ready, and as this thing disappeared and I kept my gun focused, two men appeared on the property whom I did not recognize. They were not fellow officers. They told me they were related to the woman inside. They both had firearms drawn but kept them by their side. I asked them if they knew what was going on. They both looked at me like I had two heads. The one guy said, you don't know. The second man just nodded toward the creature, whispering something. He began to tell me that this home is being attacked by a strange creature, the same creature that also attacked his daughter while he was trying to get her home from school just weeks ago. They were kind of like an unofficial band of men who were trying to track down this creature. 
He also informed me they had been tracking this beast for weeks after it killed several livestock in another rural area. I began to inform him about animal control, but he said that they had already done so and they did not believe us. And then he showed me photos of his wife's injuries after this beast tried to kill her in cold blood. That photo will stay with me. His photo was of his wife laying on an emergency room table, fresh stitches all across her right side, face, and neck, and also needing her jaw wired shut due to nearly being bitten off by this thing. Immediately, both men's attention went right towards the woods where this creature disappeared, both drawing the firearm. The one man with the photo began shooting several times, and just then, we could hear the growling. And just there, faintly beyond the light of the house in the darkness, was this creature again. I've been trying to figure out what I was looking at. Werewolves aren't real. What else could this thing be if it's not a werewolf? Was this thing possibly some kind of mutation or maybe some sort of lab experiment? I don't know, but it kind of vanished again in the woods and things seemed to calm down that night. I took the names and members of the two gentlemen who seemed to want to help and let me know if there's anything I could share with them to help track down this strange creature. The woman inside the house refused to speak to me or even come out and acknowledge my presence. I think she was so frightened by what had just happened. Personally, I have no explanations for any of this. I just know that it was a very, very strange call and a very strange night. I was hunting down in Stephenville, Texas during whitetail season. I was up in a tripod overlooking a pasture. Behind me about 50 yards away was a dry riverbed, but you couldn't see it because a dense screen of trees grew along both sides of the riverbed, but you could hike to it and there was another spot I would sometimes hunt on the other side. It was getting late, but there was still a decent amount of light. I had seen absolutely nothing that day, not even critters, so I'm sitting up in my tripod just watching when all of a sudden from behind me in or around the riverbed, I hear the most ungodly shriek howl roar that made my hair stand on end and I damn well near peed my pants. It continued for about three minutes until it suddenly stopped and that's about when I decided to call it a night. Ran the whole way back to my vehicle. I didn't see it and I to this day I still wonder what it was. Didn't sound like a bobcat or coyote and Stephenville isn't exactly known for its big cats or any cryptids. Maybe some of you hunters out there have experienced something similar. I had horses out in the pasture. My two brothers, my sister, and I think one of the boy's friends went out to see the horses. We had 80 acres which butted up to logging property in wilderness. The river was across the dirt road from our property. We went out all the time in the dark, it didn't bother us at all. I rode my horse all over the hills and was never afraid. Well anyway, we went out to find the horses and I had a flashlight I was shining in the field looking for them. I had it at chest height sweeping the field. When I shone it back across the flat part of the field towards the river I saw two orange glowing eyes looking at me. I didn't hear anything at all. It didn't move. There are no trees in that part of the field and whatever it was, was taller than me. I have never been so afraid in my life. All the hair stood up on my body and I felt weak. Never have I felt that way and I have been in the woods all my life. I knew whatever it was, I was not supposed to be there. As I watched the strange thing was it closed its left eye and turned its head to the right. This was strange to me because I thought an animal would just turn its head out of the light and that would mean its right I would leave view first. Anyway, I still did not hear anything as I turned around and started running for the house. I tried to get everyone in, but they would not come all the way into the house. I, on the other hand, did not go out at night again for a long time. Another time, when we were hunting in, say, 2004 around Green Peter, I was walking behind my husband, and in the mud I saw a track. I stopped and looked at it and looked again. I was kind of embarrassed to say anything, but I know in my heart it was a Bigfoot track. 
It had all the toes and the big toe was prominent. The back was kind of messed up because it was on a slope, but I know it was one. I wish I would have taken a picture of it. I wish I had not been embarrassed to say anything. My husband's family was camping in a houseboat on Lake Shasta when he was young. Him and his grandpa got up early to fish, and they looked up on a hill in a clear cut, and saw a black thing stand up and walk across the clear cut. Both my husband and his grandpa recall it. I don't know the year, but it must have been about 26 years ago. His grandpa told me the story and swears it was not a bear. Well, I hope I see another one. I hope it is not up close, but I want to prove to myself that it is real. I'm in the Navy and about 12 years ago, I was standing watch in a submarine engine room. We were underway, can't for the life of me remember where to, from, or just making circles. It was the mid-watch and I sat down to catch up on some logs. That's when I heard a woman's voice and felt the hairs on my neck stand straight up. No women on subs, then I got up, looked around and found the other watches shooting the shit or doing their daily tasks. I thought maybe I had dozed off and dreamt it. I sat back down and heard it again, and it sounded like it was coming from outside the hatch I was sitting under. I said F this shit out loud and went to just be around the other guys on watch. I still get chills thinking about it, even now. My husband, now ex, and I were hiking cross-country in Oregon, mostly following a creek bed that didn't seem to be used much, if at all, by other hikers. When we came around a bend in the creek, we saw something that seemed quite tall. Maybe as tall as a moose, but not a moose. At first I thought it was a bear standing up, but it was moving away from us, going in the same direction as us, across a rocky creek meadow that had opened up suddenly and that also had several boulders strewn about. It looked over its shoulder briefly during one of its strides, like a nonchalant or natural action, not a craning of the neck or anything, and continued on. It was almost like its head automatically turned slightly in the direction of the back swinging arm. It seemed I could make out arms swinging, but I admit my mind was whirling. It was not a moose. The face was flat, there was no rack or anything animal looking about it. It then turned away from the creek bed and went up the mountainside. Although I got the impression that this was not a last minute, panic decision because of us just that it was continuing on its original planned course, very leisurely looking. It mostly went straight up very easily and just barely cutting across the natural slope. Either this thing had been right in front of us for a while, moving along the same creek bed, or we caught it just having come off the mountain or just having started to move off at that point. It seemed more like it had been ahead of us the whole time, which was a creepy feeling. Anyway, I had not been looking for any footprints, I'm a rock hunter, and had no belief or interest in Bigfoot at that time. Details of location and terrain are few, but I have seen elk, moose, buffalo, and grizzly bear in various other treks. This seemed at first glance, and without much to use for scale, to be much larger than any of those, and appeared to be on two legs taller than it was long or wide. I only got glimpses of it as it went around boulders, trees, etc., and I did not attempt to get closer. We immediately headed back the way we came and spent one uneasy night in the wilderness before getting back to our car probably about a six-hour hike in. I do know I forced my husband to put as much distance as possible between us and the thing that night. I even forced us to go on in the dark using flashlights as slow going as it was jumping at every cracking tree limb and every rustle of a bush. That's it, except for the one other thing I did notice before I turned and scurried away, practically knocking over my husband in my desire to run. I grew up in a house where my backyard was a huge forest in rural Illinois. When I was a kid, I loved being outdoors and would take every possible opportunity to run amok in the woods with my best friend. 
When we were younger, 11, 12, we stayed closer to the house and the outskirts and climbed the trees. As we got older, 13, 15, we would venture deep, walking and swimming in the rivers and building little forts. When I was 16, the forest was roped off and closed off to the public as a company had began illegally dumping lead or mercury into the woods, but that's another story. It was the middle of a hot summer, and I was about 15 at the time. Dusk was approaching and my friend had to go home for dinner, but I wasn't quite ready to leave. We parted ways and I climbed up a tree near my favorite spot over the river. Now these woods backed up to a local gun club, so it wasn't uncommon to hear shooting. However, this gun club was contained in its own private property, and the members never ventured out into the forest. I sat in my tree for a little bit and ate the blackberries I'd picked earlier while watching it get darker, when I suddenly spotted movement out of the corner of my eye. At first I assumed it was a younger deer because it was larger but not huge, but I quickly realized it was a man. He seemed to be in his late 30s or early 40s, and he wore a black t-shirt and camo pants with creepy, wiry facial hair. He was skulking like he didn't want to be seen. I thought this was odd, but had no intention of making my presence known since something felt wrong, and being a 15-year-old girl alone in the woods, I knew I was at a disadvantage. I slowed my breath down and watched. At first, he didn't say anything as he walked around the base of the trees. It was around that time that I realized he had a gun slung over his back. Once he got near the river where my friend and I had been loudly goofing off maybe ten minutes earlier, he started calling out, Hey, anyone here? Help. While grabbing his rifle. When there was no response and no noise, he gave up after a few minutes and began walking downstream. I waited until it was pitch black before sliding out of that tree as quietly as I could, running home and having my parents call the cops. They never found anything. I could never bring myself to go back. My name is Officer T. Williamson, and I'm currently an officer in a small town east of Phoenix, Arizona. My encounter involves an online report that I had read from a man who goes by the name of Ken. The report detailed how he and his family have been being harassed by what they believe to be a demon for almost three years now. Mr. Ken begins the report by describing the very first encounter he had with this evil entity, which occurred back in the fall of 2013 at their home in Arizona. While nobody else was around except for his wife, who at the time was taking a shower, he explains that out of nowhere, he hears her scream from upstairs. So he runs up there to see what's wrong, only to find her standing there frozen with terror written all over her face, staring into the nothingness. When he asked her what was wrong, she described a tall, dark figure standing in the corner of their bedroom right outside of their bathroom door. Mr. Ken claims that when he looked in the same corner, all he saw was a pitch black void where the figure had been standing, which caused this intense feeling of dread to come over him, made him feel as if death were staring him into his very soul. He told his wife there's nothing there, let her out of the bathroom for fear of her safety, after she clearly voiced concern about going back into the room, and with it still being very present, she had a hard time even going back in there, just turning off the shower. Ken then explains how throughout the next three years, this entity would go on to harass the family, manifesting in just about a different form every night. Whether it be the same dark figure or sometimes this evil-looking gnome creature with red eyes, and another time he claims it appeared as a spirit made of pure fire. He said that although nothing ever physically happened to anybody within the house, everyone has experienced scratch marks, cuts, bruising all over their bodies for no real reason at all, all happening at separate times. Ken too claims that whatever this thing is, loves to stand outside the bathroom door while people are showering and appears to be immune to things like crosses or crucifixes or even holy water. Going deeper into the report that I read, it didn't go into too much more detail about this entity. 
But from what Ken did say, it sounded like this was a type of spirit that takes the form it believes will frighten its victim, the most a shape-shifting spirit. That being said, if Ken's family has been dealing with one for almost three years, I would say they have done very well in keeping whatever this thing was harassing them away from harming anybody. I'm not sure why this thing chose to show itself now after all these years, but maybe something happened recently to make it think attacking them might be possible. It also makes me wonder whether or not whoever wrote this report actually recorded everything their demon did throughout all the years and left that stuff out when writing about it, just in case anybody reading it decided to call them out on their story. I don't think what Ken has been experiencing was either a demon or a bogart, but an entity that he and his family unintentionally invoked by possibly playing around with some kind of occult paraphernalia which caused a ritualistic nightmare spirit to cross over from the spirit realm into their home, which they then failed to send back. If this really did go on for three years straight, I would say whatever is going on with their house definitely falls under the paranormal category instead of something rational. Like waking up at night and scratching yourself with your eyes still closed because you were dreaming about scratching yourself when in reality you're just moving around in your sleep due to maybe a medical condition or maybe even suffering from sleep paralysis. Sometimes you just have to take people who claim they are being harassed by something invisible with a grain of salt. I mean, even if it is real, there might just be some sort of logical explanation of what's going on that they possibly haven't thought of yet. I live in an odd little place in Appalachia that was supposedly carved out of the mountains by a meteor. There is a 360 degree view of mountains around me at all times. Well, when I was in middle school, I got really into mountain biking. It was the 90s, don't ask. So, because I was so young, and since my mom didn't want me to be on some random mountain path that didn't have anyone on it for months, she would only let me go on deep trail with the guy who owned the bike shop and was also a co-worker as she was a teacher. Well, it had been months since I started doing weekly rides with a guy Joe was his name and a few other guys he had rode with. We went up this place we called Lake Hill as it was the road to the city's water supply which was a lake-sized natural spring. We'd been riding for hours. I mean like daybreak to probably an hour before dark. We just got to the point where we were going to turn around when we crest this hill and bam. There stands a dude. Wearing camo gear, a yellow raincoat in the middle of summer, standing about 15 feet away from a four-wheeler with a shotgun in his hand. Joe, who was the most athletic of us, was in front. I think I had gotten behind him and there were two other guys behind me. When you're pedaling a mountain bike up a steepish hill, you're not looking forward, you're looking down or at least at the ground. You're studying where your wheel is going so you don't run over anything that might ruin your momentum. So when I ran into the back of Joe, I was kind of pissed. I looked up sharply and saw Joe, positioning himself between me and the dude. The man said nothing. Not one single word. Not a word of comfort or compassion for the fact we just ran up on him with a shotgun. This is the South, people are hospitable. You don't see two strangers in a deserted place not say hello to one another. I swear it might be the fact I've played this event over in my head dozens of times and want to read in it what I think was happening, or this is really what happened. Guy. These mother F have just found me harvesting my pot. What if they tell the cops? Can I afford to take that chance? I don't know, there are a few of them. Shit, that one's a kid. Because I could see an edge of tension bleed out of his face when he looked at me. I swear it was him deciding to kill Joe, then deciding not to kill me. Joe, to his credit, positioned himself between the man and me the whole time. Eventually, the dude hopped on his four-wheeler, covered in plants, and rode away. I never will forget that taste of exhaustion and adrenaline as we came off that hill. Luckily in mountain bike riding the ups are the hard part. We were doing the fastest speed I still have ever done on a bike while in the mountains. 
I'm actually feeling cold and nervous talking about this. I was a field engineer doing software installation and commissioning on telecom equipment controllers. These units are located at cell sites tower bases which your phone connects to in order to provide you service and connectivity from your cell service provider. A lot of these towers are in very very remote places. In this particular project I would go in the day after the construction crews completed their tower and electrical work. I would be by myself with just my work truck, air card, and laptop. This particular site was in rural Virginia. I probably still have the email from when I was on that project with the site's coordinates, so I will try and post those later if I find them. If it's not against policy, of course. The site was about 2-3 miles into the deep woods of Virginia. It was near a now abandoned mine of some sort. Not sure exactly what they were mining for, but there was very old mining carts and drilling equipment scattered about as I was driving to the site. It was starting to get dark, but this was supposed to be a quick in and out type deal. LTE commissioning usually takes one hour or less, and since I saw a Civil War era cemetery connected to the gravel road which leads to the site, I was in more of a rush than usual. See, the thing is, when you try and rush things, especially because of fear, you will F up. And boy, did I F up. Something that should have taken one hour took over four. When I finally completed my work and closed my laptop screen, I realized how dark it was outside, and that I was all alone at the base of a tower in the middle of nowhere. I quickly gathered my belongings and headed towards my car, which was probably 60 yards away at the gate of the compound where the tower was located. When I tried to close the gate behind me, it was so dark that I couldn't see the chain and lock, so I put my car in reverse, put the e-brake up and shut off the ignition. This way my reverse lights were lighting up the gate for me so I could close it. Just trying to give you an idea of the utter darkness I was in. After all that I headed down the trail to the secondary gate, which leads to the site, about half mile from the actual compound. Same situation as before, too dark so had the car in reverse. Well, when trying to close this gate, I heard in the distance what I can only describe as the most menacing and evil female laughter. It sounded like it was pretty far away, but I got shook to the bone. I left that secondary gate wide open and noped the hell out of there. On the drive out I remembered the cemetery I had to drive by. Needless to say I didn't look at it when drove past it on the way out. After speaking with the construction crew that built the site, they also said they heard people whispering in the woods at night, but could never spot anyone. They also heard what sounded like people picking at rock with tools, but they were certain no other construction or anything was taking place anywhere for miles on end. I am in the U.S. Coast Guard, and I recently was assigned to a ship. I was going through our log books to look up something and noticed that on the bridge a unknown blue light was observed beneath the water's surface the night before. This intrigued me, so I started looking through more of the logs. Apparently, every two, three weeks, they enter lights of varying colors in places you would not expect. Usually white, red, or green lights are on the horizon, or in the sky ships and aircraft. But they seem to report colored lights under the water, sometimes moving around, sometimes stationary. Lights in the sky moving at extreme speeds, then immediately stopping or disappearing altogether. Sometimes lights are visible to the naked eye, but when we try to look at it with FLIR or night vision, they are undetectable. I was in high school that time and right in front of our house, there was a secluded park. That park is empty and peaceful, but it gets crowded at a certain time of the day because of dog owners. So my dogs are not friendly, and because of that we take them out a little bit early than others. Like usual, I checked the park out from window, and there was just a man walking around the park. 
I took my two dogs Golden Retriever and Yorkshire Terrier and went to park. I was listening to music and waiting for my dogs do their thing. I realized that bald and middle-aged man was glancing at us, but he was keeping a distance. I usually know everyone that comes to that park, but it was my first time seeing that guy. I am a paranoid person and wanted to go, but my small dog were still looking for a place to poo-poo. When my dog was sniffing around, we had to stop walking. That guy got close to us and said, I have a friend and he will bring two aggressive pit bulls here. You should get out. I was surprised and just said eight and got out. Didn't even question and walked out of the park. We could see the entire park clearly from our windows. I almost knew all the dogs that hang around in the park and even know their personalities. I never saw or heard about pit bulls nearby. After some time passed, no one was coming to the park. That man was walking kinda wobbly and talking to himself. He was holding some kind of small bag in his hand, and he was smelling that bag. We just understood immediately, but we were quite amazed by his trick to get me out. After some minutes, a grandpa and his grandchild were walking the hallway to park. That guy didn't even wait them to enter and ran to them and yelled like a crazy. That poor old man was scared a lot. He didn't say anything and just left immediately. We were fine with him getting high in our park up until now. He took a thick tree branch and ran after cats. I got even more mad and made my mom call the police. They arrived 30 minutes later. That crazy guy walked on the police too. They took him and we didn't see him that day. After a winter, we saw him again. We were like, ugh, here we go again. It was our dog's toilet time again. I was studying to my exams and asked my mom to take them out. There was also a gardener and some kids in the park. She decided to go because she was not alone with him. Dogs did their thing and she was just going out. She was just about to leave he walked on my mom and raised his arm. But thankfully he was so wobbly, he couldn't get much close. The gardener was just watching from the corner. She screamed a little and went back home. He got taken by polices for three times, but he always got back on summer days. My dad was a merchant sailor. He has seen and done some shit. Some things he still won't even tell me. Apparently there was this crew once probably more than once that included this crazy guy that slept with a hatchet, who was one room over from my dad, and also a guy who everyone hated. One day they woke up, and the guy everyone hated was missing. There was some blood around one of the portholes. The way my dad puts it, you can't fit a grown man through one of those portholes whole. I've tried, so probably murder, and no one gave a shit. I have an older guy friend who grew up in 1950s Alaska, where his dad was a bush pilot. So one day they're out flying around just for a nice day, and suddenly the entire sky goes red. Complete red and clouds and no radio. At the time he's old enough to understand what was going on, but still young that they just don't talk about it. His dad continues flying for hours and not a word, but still thinking that the Cold War had just ended in thermonuclear holocaust. It wasn't out of the question. Alaska was a target close to Russia, and this was the height of the Cold War. The sky is still forever red. Finally, they start to run out of fuel. They have to land, but they don't know what's going on and zero ability to find out. His dad eases the plane down, finds the landing strip, and goes in for an emergency landing. They make it down perfectly, no hiccups, bumps, or anything. The airport is besides itself red sky and an unannounced emergency landing, and a crew guy comes up to help them out. What's going on? His dad asked. You have no idea just how lucky you are. A volcano just went off, and you've been flying through the debris. Thank God no thermonuclear warfare, and they were stupidly lucky that the plane didn't stall out in the middle of nowhere Alaska, with a volcano spewing nearby.
When I was around 12, 15, I was hunting with my dad and his hunting buddy. I was with my dad and our friend was off a different trail. At the end of the day, we always met up where our trails met to walk back to the truck together. My dad was trying to teach our friend over the radios we used to use and couldn't get anything from him for about 20 minutes. As my dad and I are almost to the crossing, he comes on the radio and says he's on his way. We get there and soon after our friend shows up entirely out of breath and sweating like a pig. Mind you, we're in the north woods of Wisconsin during gun deer season, so he has very heavy clothing on and his spot was about one miles down the trail. He goes on to tell us why he didn't answer and what happened. He was sitting in his ground blind and saw some movement in front of him. About 50 yards ahead, he saw a black bear cub and only the cub. It sat down and started clawing at a tree trunk. He didn't move or make any noise because he knew Mama Bear was close and didn't want her to find him. He sat there watching the cub for over an hour constantly trying to find Mama Bear, but could not get eyes on her. Finally, the cub lumbered off and he decided it was safe to move out. By the time he answered us, it was already getting past dusk and starting to get dark. As he was walking, he heard a breath and felt hot warm air on the back of his neck. The man is six feet four, so there's only two things that could have been tall enough to do that. A person or a standing bear. He panicked and sprinted for over a mile down the trail until he saw us. Luckily, he wasn't chased and made it back safely, just sweaty and beat. I used to hunt as a kid with my uncle and grandpa. The first time I killed a deer, I was alone, covering my side of the mountain while they ran the deer towards me. I shot a buck right in the side, but he was just a button buck only nubs for horns. I thought it was a doe, so that's why I shot it. I was so excited, right up until I walked up to the deer and it was gasping for air. I shot it in the lung, it was horrible. I felt awful, I cried. I didn't know what I had just done. When my uncle found me like 45 minutes later me sitting next to the deer I just killed, he was so excited. But he could tell I wasn't. We dragged it out of the woods, butchered it up that night and made burgers. I couldn't finish mine, just didn't feel right. Never went hunting again, I was 15 or 16 at the time, so I was old enough to understand what was going on. Anytime anyone talks about hunting, I think back to that morning. I have no problem with people hunting by all means, but I could never go again. I-26 female recently moved from the US to the Balkans for a summer legal internship. After a few days of getting settled in my home for the summer, I decided to sign up for a gym nearby my apartment to serve as a self-care ritual and blow off steam after tough work days. Coming home from my first workout at the new gym, Endorphins on 100, I noticed at a crosswalk that a man across from this busy street where I was stopped was staring at me. Now this is not super uncommon as I have found in my new home, and I have gotten used to dealing with occasional male stares but they are usually very brief. This guy, however, was not looking away. I stared back for a full beat, so I know he knows I saw him, hoping that would be the end of it, and then turned my head away to continue down the street, trying to avoid a creepy feeling that this wasn't the end of the interaction. From what I could tell, he didn't cross the lengthy street to meet me, and probably just continued down from his side. Next thing I know, about two minutes later, I'm at a crosswalk about to cross when I see him in my peripheral next to me at the stop. How he crossed the street and sped up to meet me so quickly is either a reflection of his cunning and athletic prowess or my general lack of observational skills. Standing next to me now, he is still staring at me, but I try not to tip him off to my noticing this. I take off as fast as I can when it's safe to cross the crosswalk and naturally he matches my pace, a step or so behind me still staring. Here I find myself in a familiar situation that I imagine many who have been followed also find themselves in. 
It is a critical juncture, if you will, where you ask, is this someone following me or a silly misunderstanding? I begin to ask myself, am I overreacting? I have been followed many a time before, sadly, and so I have found that the best way to handle it is try to cut the baby in half, so to speak. I give them the benefit of the doubt to prove to me they aren't doing what I fear they are doing, while also trying to avoid any situation that would escalate the danger or cue him off to where I am going. Trust but verify. So I decide to zip quickly toward another street. Not my own, we were like one block from my apartment by the time I noticed him at the crosswalk with me, in the hopes that he would prove me wrong and not continue to follow me. This was a busy intersection, and there were about six different streets to follow from the crosswalk. He follows me down this random street of choice, where there is truly only residential buildings, no stores or restaurants he could be headed toward to explain him choosing this street unless he lived nearby. I do something I have done before when followed to test the other person. I slow down and speed up my pace randomly to see if they match mine or like a normal person heading somewhere, try to walk by me as there was plenty of room to do so on this street. Within a block or so I realized he was definitely following, definitely still staring. But not only that, with every few steps, I felt his presence, keeping pace, was also subtly getting closer and closer to me. The sun is setting at this point, and we are walking towards a part of town I don't know as well. The spirit moves and I decide to make a break for it. I slow down as slow as I have gone throughout this whole pursuit, checking my peripheral and jettison myself across the street until I get to the other side. I look back once I am there to see that he is now looking across the street and moving toward it to follow me more. But this time, I give him the meanest glare I can muster and reach for my bag as if to suggest that I reaching for pepper spray or something hadn't bought some yet in reality because I had just moved to town a few days before. He notices the gestures, makes eye contact, stops, and then literally turns his head away to feign looking at the numbers on the street like he was lost or looking for a specific spot as if he hasn't been slowing up and speeding down with me for the past 10 minutes, not looking anywhere but at my backside. Acting 010 for capturing the innocence of someone definitely not creepily following a woman half his age back from the gym for 20 plus minutes. He continues to pretend to look around, glance back at me, look around some more, glance back at me, and when he looks away for the third time, I decide now is the time to truly make a break for it. I begin booking it down the opposite street, while occasionally peering back to see if he kept following. I take a bunch of well-lit, busy streets, employing random unnecessary turns, as I have when I have been followed before. Eventually, once I check out the whole street and feel confident I have lost him, I finally calculate my way back home. The next day, I asked a friend from work who is local to take me to get some pepper spray. I bought a mini version, the smallest size that can easily fit a purse. The pepper spray's brand's name for a bottle of this size is literally called Madam, which is emblazoned across the side of the bottle in bright pink lettering. This happened to my grandfather years ago. I guess he was out hunting and walking around in some woods, maybe five miles from a main road near where my family settled north of Pittsburgh. He said that he started seeing these burnt out candles and started picking them up for some reason. He followed them for like a 100 yards, and at the very end, there was a circle of black candles with a hole in the ground that looked to be a grave. He brought all the candles home and my grandma yelled at him and made him throw them away. I was canoeing into my hunting area a few years back. Came around a bend and saw some teenagers, maybe 20 year olds walking down the train tracks. I waved hello and they proceeded to shoot a couple bullets in the river 40 yards in front and behind my boat. I have never been so angry in my whole life. I thought about going ashore downstream and sneaking up behind them to let a few bullets rip myself, 
but was afraid I might accidentally kill someone. This happened about two years ago on October 27th. I do a lot of hiking and I wanted to share with you all what is without a doubt one of the strangest things that I have experienced while hiking. While on the way back from the summit of Mount San Jacinto in California, a fairly popular trail. Just as day was changing over to dusk about 4 miles and 2,000 vertical feet, a good 2-3 hour hike from the tram, we spotted a woman dressed in all black flapper attire with the exception of a white scarf. This woman was in dress shoes and carrying a very nice beaded purse. She was walking very intently and at a hurried pace up the mountain. If you're familiar with the hike, it's at the top of the Wellman Divide. Nearly without words I asked her if she was lost, to which she replied. I'm on the trail errant I. Her face looked gray and her lips were sort of blue. It was pretty cold outside. So as quickly as she had passed us she was gone. My friend and myself looked at each other like, now we have seen everything. After conversations with other hikers on the way down that had also seen her, I was kiddingly remarking that I was sure we had seen some sort of ghost. Looking for a lost love much like the mysterious lady in black story folklore. It was a truly bizarre experience. About an hour later we were resting at Round Valley and we saw her again. Keep in mind, this is literally in the middle of the forest at 9,000 feet elevation. A good two hours hike from anything and the temps were around 35 degrees. The fact that is so close to Halloween was not lost on me either. At any rate, I make no claims of the supernatural, but I'm not ruling it out. But I thought everyone might enjoy the story and the pictures of this truly strange encounter. I worked offshore for five years as an ROV pilot, the robots that go underwater. I have seen some odd things. Worked on a job where the field we were working on has barrels at bottom of ocean. We were told we couldn't go near these with a robot. Apparently these were dumped by the US government during Cold War era. Who knows what was in those barrels, I've seen all kinds of rare creatures, including exclusive six-skill sharks. One of the cooler things I saw was an eel eating another eel the exact same size. Imagine a snake underwater eating another snake exact same size. That was pretty cool because it looked like the eel detached its jaw like a snake and everything. Also is seen giant bluefin tuna. Tuna in general can be anywhere from surface to a couple thousand feet down. The ability to dive like that still amazes me. I worked in the oil spill in the Gulf. To see oil just pour out like that is something we have all seen, but to be there and realize that's just below you a mile below is something else. For me, it was crazy to see that many robots underwater at same time as you have usually max 4-2 vessels, but rarely. It was chaotic as heck. The vessels out there were so close we could almost just have conversations with people by shouting, which is very rare. One of the crazy things I won't forget is two vessels were flaring off literally just burning off oil, and I could feel the heat from their vessel on the one I was. I have whole stories I could talk about that really, but to be part of something that was that huge, even though it wasn't a good thing in our history, I can still say I was part of it and be proud to stop the spill. I was a U.S. Army infantryman deployed to Afghanistan in 26, 2007 on the Pakistan border. I spent the majority of my nighttime deployment sitting outside of the FOB in mounted OPS because the CO thought if we did this then, the enemy wouldn't move at night. Which was ridiculous because nothing happens at night over there. Seriously, they don't have street lights or electricity, so unless it's a full moon you could trip into a wadi and break your neck. But anyway. So I spend 16 months over there taking turns sitting in the turret of the truck staring out into darkness. One I seeing green from NODS and the other seeing nothing from the pitch black. I got very accustomed to viewing the world this way and if anything moved my eyes would pick it up instantly. 
Most of the time it was dogs or sheep or whatever, so no big deal. So eight months in, I lose one of my best friends to a landmine. One of the shittiest days of my life. Us being infantry, we got about two hours back at the FOB to try to comprehend what just happened before the CO sends us back out on patrol, yay. So I'm sitting there in the turret staring out into the darkness, as usual thinking about the things that had just gone down. So obviously my mind isn't in the best place. Regardless, as I am staring out into the darkness, my non-night vision, I catches some movement off to my right and I distinctly see the silhouette of a person. This person is moving around the outside of our perimeter, and I figuratively shit my pants since this hasn't happened at all during my time there. So naturally, I snap my head towards the movement to get a good picture of this person with my night vision to attempt to figure out what kind of crazy local villager is trying to get shot. Nothing is there. Creepy as F. So I figure I'm just stressed from losing my friend and calm myself down and settle back in for the rest of guard duty. So I go back to looking straight ahead and sure as shit as soon as my eyes get back to 12 o'clock, I see movement again out of my peripheral. Figurative pants shitting happens again. Again nothing is there through night vision. Still creepy as F. So at this point I've about had it with this crazy country and being shot at and all that stuff so I think to myself. Okay F it, let's see what happens. So I turn my head back to 12 and watch out of my peripheral vision, and I distinctly remember the shape of a person walking around the outside of our perimeter. I can only see this dark figure when I'm not looking directly at it, but like I said at this point I have no FS left to give, so I sit and watch. As I sit and watch I get the feeling that I know the figure who is patrolling our perimeter, and I am filled with the thought that it was my buddy who we had just lost earlier that day. Creepy instantly turned to comforting and I sat and watched the movement as long as I could. I still to the day believe it was him. So that's my story. I used to hike a park near my house, had been hanging out there for years. One time I was walking the main trail when I noticed an opening in the brush leading to an area I had never been before. I love exploring so I of course decided to check it out. I was walking around for a while when I noticed a fairly large bone in the leaves. I wasn't too concerned as we lived in a very ethnic neighborhood and I just assumed it was a cow or pig bone that someone had left from butchering, but then I noticed the very human-looking pelvic bone laying close by. I stood there for a moment sort of comparing my pelvis to the one on the ground before getting my knife out and getting the F out of there. I called the police and led them to the bones, and they agreed that the remains were human, although they theorized it was probably a homeless person. Grew up playing in the woods behind our house, cross-country skiing and snowmobiling in the winter, ice skating on the pond. There were no other houses up there, occasionally a snowmobile would pass through, but not often. One summer when I was a bit older, 15 maybe, went up there to ride my friend's dirt bike. There were some jumps up at the top of a cliff that we would take turns hitting, so I'm riding on the back up through the woods, and as we are passing the pond, there is a tent. I say WTF and tell my friend to stop. I get off to investigate while he stays on the bike, but shuts it off. I was approaching the tent from the back, and the window was open, and I see the tent is full of clothes, food, liquor, beer. Of course, I'm rattling off all of this to my friend when I happen to look up and see that there is someone sitting in the doorway of the tent with their back to me. They haven't moved and are just facing forward with their back to me, which is odd because clearly they heard me. At this point I turn around and start waving to my friend and mouthing, let's get out of here, as if I can somehow sneak away now. Finally the guy says very calmly, come around. I stopped in my tracks and looked back, he's still not facing me and he says it again, come around. At this point my friend is starting the dirt bike, and he yells, What did you say? The response again is just, Come around. 
I jump on the back of the bike and we tear out of there up to the top of the cliff. There is a dirt access road up to the top as there is a water tower up there, but it's a pretty rough road so we assume this dude isn't going to drive up there. We stop the bike and head over to the edge of the cliff to see if this guy is following us. Sure enough he comes walking out of the woods from the same trail we came out on. He then proceeds to walk over towards some bushes and starts pulling branches down to reveal a gray truck that he had hidden. After uncovering the truck he opens a box in the back and pulls out a rifle or a shotgun then walks around and gets in the driver's side and starts hauling ass up the road. We take off running, I just run into the woods, my friend is screaming at me to get on the bike, but I tell him to just go and I keep running off into the woods. The truck comes to the top and stops by the water tower. I'm a good distance into the woods, but I can see the wheels of the truck, and I hear the guy get out and start walking around. At this point I'm scared shitless, but just trying not to make any noise. It seems like forever. But he finally gets in his truck and drives off. So I start running through the woods again, away from the way we came. I eventually come out to a big field. There is a house at the other end of the field, and I know the people who live there. I really don't want to go back through the woods to get home, so I figure maybe they can give me a ride. So I'm walking through the field and I see a gray truck driving up the road at the other side of the field. There are round hay bales scattered around the field, so I duck behind one of those and peer out to see the truck is stopped, just sitting there. Now what? So I make my way back towards the woods keeping the hay bale between me and the truck. Eventually he just drives off. I eventually make it to the house at the edge of the field. Tell them what happened, of course they will give me a ride, and they are calling the police. Police go up and check it out. The tent is there, but no one is there. They tell my parents that they don't know who it was, but that someone had skipped out at the local halfway house, and they hadn't seen him in about a week. He drives a gray truck. A week or so later, my friend comes by on his dirt bike and says there are a bunch of state cops up by the pond, so we ride over there to see what's up. The tent has been burned and a bunch of other stuff was still smoldering, Never found out if they ever found the guy or not. Back in August 2006, I was 20 years old and working in a deli near my house. While I also attended a community college nearby, I remember it was a warm summer night and I was working till close, which was 7 p.m. and at the time it was around 6.30 p.m. The only two people left in the deli were my boss and I. I remember I was stocking drinks in the cooler towards the back of the store when I heard the front door open so naturally I looked, and it was a guy I had never seen before. And working at the same deli for eight plus years you tend to remember people, and so I figured he might have been from out of town. He had red hair and it almost looked like an afro which I thought was strange. He walks back towards me, and he goes into the cooler and grabs a peach snapple, and soon as he walked past me the smell hit me. So I motioned to my boss and pinched my nose, and he and I had a brief chuckle before I started walking to the front to ring the guy up. I get to the counter, and soon as I looked up at this guy, I felt my stomach drop. His eyes were black, and he had pale skin and this blank stare. It's hard to explain, but I felt as if he was looking through me and not at me. I asked him if he needed a bag, and I got no response he paid for the Snapple and walked outside of the deli, and then stood at the front of the store. So we closed up the store at 7, and we started cleaning up and 7.30 comes around and I look, and this guy is still standing at the front of the store leaning up against the glass. He was so strange that my boss thought he was staking out the place waiting for us to leave, but technically he was a paying customer, so we couldn't tell him to leave just for being weird. So we shut the lights off and were walking out when my boss turns to the guy and says, Hey, I don't mind you hanging out here, but please don't lean on the glass. The guy turns to him and doesn't say a word, he just smashes the Snapple bottle on the ground at my boss's feet and my boss at the time was a big guy. 
I'm talking about six foot, 380 pounds and covered in tattoos. So my boss gets in his face and says, what the F is wrong with you, dude? Now you're going to clean that shit up. The guy stares back at him again, not staying a word, and the whole time I'm thinking to myself, this guy is either insane or has the largest testicles on earth. Then after a few seconds he turns away and gets in his car and drives off. I go back inside and get a broom, and I swept it up and we called it a night. Wasn't the first time we had someone high come into the store. The next morning I woke up and put the news on, and the first thing I see is that guy's face. Turns out the same night he stopped by our deli. He murdered and dismembered his neighbor right down the street from the deli. The cops caught him pulling up into his parents' driveway the next morning with the women's severed head in his trunk. To this day I wonder whether or not he committed the murder before or after he came to the deli. I don't remember seeing any blood on him, but then again, I wasn't really looking for any. I live in Marcus Hook, Pennsylvania in Delaware County. I went to college in Philadelphia. My parents moved to Florida a few months ago, but they kept their house here. So I'm living in it right now. The property is along the bank of the Delaware River. The river is 20 or so yards from the back door of the house. I had found a new job and I stayed up later and later. I was bored and with nobody else to hang out with. Most nights I would wind up outside in a lawn chair, fishing in the river until three in the morning. It was on a night like this when the first incident happened. I wasn't paying too much attention around me. I was watching something on my phone and my rod started bouncing around like crazy. I jumped up to set the hook, jerking it back. The line went slack for a second and then jerked away. I figured I had a fish on, but when I tried to reel again it wouldn't budge. I thought maybe I was snagged, but then the line snapped away again. I'm not an expert fisherman, but the way the line moved was odd. Not like a typical fish bite, but like something in the water was purposely pulling back on the line each time I did. It was almost like it was intelligent. I was a bit freaked out and I ended up just cutting the line and heading back inside. I told myself it was caught on a snag or something but I suspected otherwise. A week later I had fallen asleep in my chair and I woke up startled after hearing a large splash in the water just a few yards out. The light from my back porch barely hit the edge of the water and I could see a series of rings spreading out from where something had entered the water. A new set of rings then appeared a few feet away, and then again and again until they were out of sight. I was a bit baffled since catfish or bottom feeders seldom come to the surface of the water, and they rarely jump. I grabbed my gear and headed inside, but in my groggy state, I left my cutting board knife and a fresh bag of bait. I used pepperoni for catfish sitting on the ground outside. The next day I realized what I had done and I went outside to retrieve it. Everything was gone. In the patch of dirt near where I had left the stuff I could see faint prints. Some kind of thin-footed animal with only two long slender toes had been walking through the area. I also found silvery fish scales that were spread sporadically around and both prints and the scales led straight back to the water's edge. I must admit that at this point I was a little bugged out. I didn't know what to make of the evidence, but I figured that any kind of call to the police was going to get me laughed at. I tried to find information on the prints online, but with no luck. I decided that I would give fishing a rest for a while. I needed to get better sleep anyway. I was starting to get tired halfway through the day at work. Two weeks went by and I hadn't been back outside to fish. I had started dating a new girl. Between her and work I pretty much forgot all about the tracks. But then the most bizarre incident occurred. I was fast asleep in the room upstairs when I was shaken awake by my girlfriend. She told me that my dog was downstairs barking like crazy. I'm a heavy sleeper and probably wouldn't have noticed, but sure enough he was downstairs going nuts. Before I reached the stairs the barking abruptly stopped but then it turned into a low growl. I felt a twinge of panic. 
My girlfriend was behind me on the stairs and we crept down quietly. I could see the dog standing at the back door in a rigid posture growling at something outside. I walked quietly over to him and tried to calm him down. I was stroking his head when I heard my girlfriend let out a gasp. She was looking through the small window of the back door. I stood up to look for myself. Unmistakably, there were two bipedal creatures, no more than three feet tall, walking around my backyard. It was dark and the lights were off, but I could make out a pallid silver color to them. They had no eyes that I could see, but something like a fin was running along the spine of each creature. We stood frozen for a few moments watching these two creatures. At one point, they ambled over to each other. I swear that they were making hand gestures toward the house. My girlfriend saw this too and whispered that she was going to call the cops. She ran upstairs to grab her phone while I stayed and watched for a few more minutes. My dog started barking again and this time both creatures just walked away towards the river and disappeared under the water. The police arrived about 20 minutes later and looked around. They didn't see any sign of the creatures, but said that they had found some wet prints outside. They were the exact same ones that I had seen on the ground a few weeks ago. Since no crime was committed, they didn't seem too interested. But the officers took my report and told me to call again if anything else happened. So this was a month ago. I've looked online for any kind of information on these creatures, but I can't find anything. I haven't gotten a good night's sleep since, and my girlfriend has refused to come back to the house. Do you have any idea what these creatures may have been? My event took place on 2021 at 18 in Denver, Colorado. In the two half years following my event, I have had a host of very strange phenomena happen to me. I have been shy about talking about these things from what I believe is a result of my interaction with this object. The event started with me witnessing a bright yellow cylinder craft hovering above Interstate 70 just east of Denver. At the time I felt a sudden fear, but that feeling quickly changed to euphoria. I don't remember much after that other than waking in my bed the next morning. About two months after my encounter sighting, all of the moles on my body began to fade and then completely disappear. To date, five moles have completely disappeared and nine more are in different states of fading. About five months after this event occurred, all of the hair on my arms and legs began to change to light blonde and mass. I have medium brown hair and am only 31 years old. Although I originally considered premature graying, I began to notice the individual hairs changed color from the root upwards. And when the hair started to change, it took about five days for the complete hair change. The top of the hair fading from medium brown to reddish to blonde. So it was not as if it was growing out this color and no amount of sun exposure has ever caused lightning like this on me before. Also, the hairs that have changed colors have actually changed in consistency. They were originally a medium coarseness, and now they are feather soft fine. About two months ago, the spider veins in my legs began to fade, and now one that I have had for about seven years is completely gone, and another is fading rapidly. Since this has occurred, I have had dreams almost nightly of entities who talk to me and claim to be intelligent species from somewhere else and they keep trying to give me strange information I don't understand. I woke up a few times and caught myself uttering some language that I have never heard before. But I have ruled out speaking in tongues because it seems this language seems to have structure and form. I also have feelings of hot and cold in different parts of my body. I get pulsating feelings on the bottom of my feet up my legs down my arms and on the palms of my hands. Sometimes this pulsating becomes so intense it is painful. I have also felt this heat pulsating feeling right below my eyes, between my eyes, and in the front of my brain. I am very upset and confused as to what is going on with me. I live on the back of the ranch where I work. I got the job in college and I've graduated since but working the olive orchard or vineyard since has been pretty gratifying. 
My first year living on site, third year working there, I got really drunk and drove the utility vehicle. I'm responsible for out into the enchanted forest. This is the place the cows run off to when a bad rainstorm comes through. The ranch hand before me took off immediately when my boss told him to move out so I could take over, and when I did so there were 15 head of cattle. I was on top of this number and counted them each and every day I fed them. Some calves had come in, so the number had jumped up. But the point was that if something happened to a particular cow, I would notice by the end of the day and could search for her or him if it was a bull. Anyways, I'm toasted and enjoying revving this Kawasaki mule up and down the different hilly sections of the far end of the ranch by starlight when a shit ton of vultures burst into the air in front of me. I screech to a halt as a horrible smell fills the air and find myself staring into the maggoty eyes of a recently dead cow. She's still got flesh, so she hasn't been dead long, but I don't recognize her from the small herd I deal with every day. There's a thick scent of death and something else in the air. I leave the headlights on the mule running and circle around her with my LED flashlight and see a huge, sickly flesh balloon dropped out from between her hind legs. Working on a ranch, you get used to death because it's a huge part of the whole thing. But the strange smell behind the familiar scent was this pouch coming out of her containing her stillborn fetus. As best I can figure, she had died attempting to give birth after the herd had rejected her following her isolation from them during some kind of sickness under the previous ranch hand's term, something he had never mentioned to me or my boss. The smell was worse the next day when I used a forklift to carry or drag her into a shallow grave in order to dump lime all over her. But stumbling across her while chasing a stargazing spot is forever etched into my mind. During the summer of 1989, my girlfriend and I decided to take a few days and go visit my mother and family in Spokane, Washington. We lived in Southern California and I have driven north to visit her a few times. I usually stick to the main interstates for fear of running out of gas. Anyway, on this particular drive I decided to take a shortcut through Oregon to try and save some time. I saw on the map that Highway 97 would be a good route to take. I knew that Bend was a fairly good sized town with services if I needed them. The night was beautiful with a little moonlight, so I opened up the moonroof on the car so I could peek up at it from time to time. The road had tall timbers on both sides and it was pitch black beyond them. My girlfriend was asleep at the time, the road took a slow curve to the right. I was probably driving around 50-55 miles per hour, when suddenly to my right my headlights lit up a huge hairy creature. It was walking upright on two legs and heading the same direction I was traveling so I couldn't see a face. I could make out its height of about 7-8 feet. I had to look up out of the windshield at it. It had reddish, dirty brown hair, broad shoulders, and a short neck with a rounded head. I quickly put my foot on the brake, hoping my tail lights would give my a view from my rear view mirror, but it didn't work. I took the next turn out which was a few hundred feet down the road. I woke up my girlfriend and told her what I saw. At first she thought I was kidding around until I turned the car around and went back to see if it was still there. No luck, it must have got spooked and made off into the woods. I'm an avid hunter and outdoorsman. I know what bears and elk and moose look like, and this was neither. I know what I saw, and it was him. I will never forget that night. When I tell my friends of the story, they believe me, because I'm a very trustworthy guy, and I don't make up stories for the hell of it. Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night, folks, and see you tomorrow at the same time.